Welcome to another episode of the Tea and Trails podcast. And my name is Gary Thwaites, 254 marathoner, Lakeland 100 and Dragon's Back Race V50 champ and runner-up, the 1984 Miners Strike Disco. It would have been first, Eddie, but they just weren't ready. They weren't ready for those moves. <laughs> what was the music of choice for the Miners Strike dancing competition? Oh, I should have done this. This is bad admin. I should have Googled what was number one, what was top 10 in 1984. I don't Stop, know. I've got to look. Top, top 10. My kid got in the van yesterday and said, do you know, have you heard of Eminem, mum? Um, yes, I think you'll find he was, he's my generation child. Uh, top 10, music, top. We're going deep right at the start, eh? The lyrics are pretty fruity though for Eminem. With the, yeah, we don't get that far. Music for minor. Oh, I've lost this kid gone forever. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm Eddie Sutton. Totally exhausted, <laughs> number three. It used to be ultra runner, and now just a wizened old shell of a woman. Wizened? That, that's that's the wizened. top word of the day. I love that it. Wizened. I spelled it W-H-I-Z-E-N-E-D. I'm not sure that, would you put an H in that? I'm not going to question My that. kids find H is really hard because the French don't really do the ash, as it's called. Ah. So when there's an H in like an English word, they're like... Oh, where does that where, where does that one fit in? <laughs> anyway. A lot of people struggle with twits. Twats. Just I just go straight yeah. for twats. I get twits twats. Yeah. <laughs> I get that too. Twits. That's not my surname. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's get this done, Gary. Oh my god, we have we're not good today. The combination is it's weak. It's a weak fracture, but we're gonna pump this up. My kettle's boiling. So there's gonna be a cuppa. You might if you're watching this on YouTube, you're gonna see no cuppa in about five minutes. A cuppa is gonna appear. Yeah, there's no way we're getting through this without a huge vat of tea. Anyway, all will be explained later. We have Tales from the Trails. We pop over Strava and I try and get every ounce of course knowledge from James Nobles. And we share our insane weekly deets. It's so exciting what we've been up to. Hold fire, guys. It's Oof, coming. It's wild. Howdy. <laughs> and thanks to our Patreon partners. <laughs> You've actually put in the script. Howdy. Uh, <laughs> You're such a chopper. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to our Patreon partners who share some awesome discount codes with our Patreons. We have Precision Fuel and Hydration, Vela Forte, Protein Rebel, Tiki Boo, Mountain Fuel, Outdoor Active, Silver Sweden, Active Route, The Centurion Running Store, SportsShoes.com, Big Bubble Hats, X Miles, Pornside Palm Cottages, Yugoku Projects, Red Bear Sports, The Alban App Retainer Group, Cycle Protection, Summit Crazy, Baited Sports, Lumi Active Wear, and Ultra Trails 2. Oh my goodness me, that is a mouthful these days. Extra shout out to Precision Fuel and Hydration, Vela Forte and Protein Rebel. We use their products every month to help fuel, hydrate and recover. We have another new Patreon partner too. Patreons can receive 20% off over at Hellfire Events. Lots of races and different distances to choose from over at hellfireevents.com. Thank you, Hellfire Events, for supporting the podcast. If you'd like to save some money, support the podcast and our partners, please consider joining Patreon. We couldn't do this without you guys. Pop over to Summit Crazy if you'd like to buy some awesome tea and trails merch. Thank you to Precision Film Hydration for sponsoring this month's show. I'm ready to smash some of those 90 gram gels up that first climb. I'm going to do two, two each climb. Jokes <laughs> at the weekend. Um, I'm making my little bags for each time I see my drop bag. I'm going to put one in, one in per drop bag, 90 grams, because I do a lot of um, normal food as well on these mega runs. But you always want to have a mix because if something goes wrong, you feel a bit, you can get a gel down. You can either, I'm a big believer in the two markets, you can either get a gel down. Or you can't. There's no like in between, is there? You're either like, shells are going down like a dream. Yeah. Smashing it. Or you're like, no way. Hand me the baby bell and the fisherman's friends. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> Mark Bellis sent a lovely message via the gram to say, thank you for reading so much. Thank you so much for reading his question out to Emily from Precision Full Nidration last week about running whilst being diabetic. He said he found it really useful and he and some really good advice in there too. So that was lovely. Thanks, Mark. Awesome. And keep us posted on how you get on. If you're a patron, you get 15% off over at Precision Fuel and Hydration Towers. Anyone can get 15% off their first order with the caps lock code T24. Super simple. 
code T24. Who wants to go first? Mine's oh, quite... It's not yeah, running. But you, running. You are in the trenches. This is it. I'm You're in the, the cold face. You want to, you want to, oh, well, I'm in the cold <laughs> face of children. I'm not in the cold face of training. So, guys, if you're like into parenting, you're like got kids, it's all a bit of a juggle, or you like that sort of stuff, listen now, next 20 minutes. If you're here for the running content, just pass on by 20 minutes and then you can hear Gary whine about all his miles that he's got. Splits. Trying. Let's. Anyway, two weeks before the Northern Traverse last week. So I always like a heavy taper into these races, different to a 100 mile taper, 50 mile taper. Be where you want to like keep the springiness and get strides done. I like to really soak it in, rest up and kind of decondition a little bit because you want to really, you want those carb stores to be fully, you want everything to be like, you want to feel a bit unfit basically. Like, God, when did I last run? So you feel super fresh. Mm. Even if that makes the first few hours you feel a bit sluggish, that's the sort of look I'm going for. Now, this is what I plan to do and not by choice. Oh my gosh, I have had the week from the last five days, Gary. I I, I don't know. It was just like possibly the hardest few days I've had with my kids ever. And I'm going to tell you all about it because sharing's caring, isn't it? Anyway, got my last three gym sessions done. Super light. I had like eight exercises to do with hardly any weights like a plank I never do a plank I was like God I'm not sure if I can do a plank but do you feel I've done this when I've gone back and I've reduced the weight a plank press up it's super, Honestly, super easy it's like wow yeah, I really came easy. out no comparison okay I get a lot of messages from people that compare what I do to them I don't compare what you don't compare what you do to me and I don't you know we're all different so whatever I say is only me it's only Eddie and she's very individual as we all know anyway well, yeah I picked up the 10 kilogram double the d- dumbbell and I was like, literally, like carrying a sort of small cotton wool, but there's nothing. <laughs> shake out. Yeah, I, did, I thought, God, this is how Gary must feel in his gym sessions. This is Every so time. easy, done. <laughs> and I can walk out the steps at the gym, out of the gym, like not having to hold the banister and have a little weep at the receptionist. <laughs> she always laughs so much, the lady that sits at the reception. She's like, Eddie, you're the strongest person in here. And you come up, the, I always know it's you coming up the steps because you're like, <laughs> 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 anyway, take those off. They were a bit tricky to fit in because the week was mad. But I was like, mentally, I wanted to get them done. And I knew I'd feel better for a bit of lunging. Love a good lunge, Gary. Oh, yeah. um, a good lunge. So got those done. Did my last long run. A bit of a disaster. Not in a physical sense, but we. I decided I normally do my long runs on a Thursday. But oh, my God, the weather. I took the dogs out for a quick 20-minute trot really early, still dark. The rain was like this sort of half hail, half sleet. I couldn't actually, the the burn hitting me of this cold rain, where my, this is so overshare, (laughs) where my jacket ended and my lower legs torso began. You know that area, the lady area, (laughs) where the the ice was like hitting there, it was hurting so bad. I was like, do you know what? Some people would say, this is a really good idea. Go out for two hours, put your full wet weather kit on and practice. I don't know who those people are. They're not friends of mine. I don't want to. I've done the spy. I don't need to do that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't need to practice hobbling around in waterproof trousers. <laughs> so I moved my long run to the next day when it was due to not rain, which was a wise idea. Because also, I mean, battling this cold, I was like, I really don't need to be like... <laughs> anyway, so we chose to do it on Friday. My mate came along with me. We both had kids skiing in the sort of like junior French championships. So they'd gone off. This is the start of the exhaustion because they'd gone off middle child having me having to get up at half past four every morning from oh. uh, to get him ready to go i mean wake so it always i always find it so wrong having to wake children up after having years of like kids you know not trying to wake the kids up then to actually yeah. get them up get them out so we'd have to get them up so early not just to getting them up early to get to this to these ski races you get one chance you know it's the the jeopardy of the as we've talked about before and i couldn't go because i've got i've got the other kids here as well so we did we just get this app to track them so we just kept stopping we'd be like five more to go right let's get down to that hut let's climb that bit and then we'll refresh then we got to the bit where he was skiing we didn't have any reception this is high then a dog tension. ran off 
This is my attention. Then, then one, not my dogs, my dogs are angels. Her dog ran off. We lost the dog for two hours, oh, Gary. God's <gasps> sake. Hours. Has he got form, this dog? Does it do that kind He's of thing? Got quite form. Often? He <laughs> loves it. He, look, he goes up and he looks and he looks up the mountains and he goes, I'm going to see yeah. you for two to three hours. I'm going to have the best time. When I come back, I'm done, by the way. Even if we're miles from home, I'm gonna. you're going to drag me all the way home because I'm gonna, he destroyed himself. Um, oh. And we didn't think of checking Facebook, but someone had put found the dog. He'd gone back to our car, was just lying there. And someone had, was waiting with the dog saying, we've got your dog. And my friend had been tagged in on all these things going, yeah. it's her dog. <laughs> we it's found wild. the dog and we but we hadn't finished our run because we'd spent so long looking for this dog so i still want to do another climb so we took the dog who then was like you're joking me you're joking <laughs> if i don't have a gel i'm not doing this so he was, I was like this is the worst the heart rate kept dropping down to like 40 beats per minute and i was getting cold and then we'd start running again and i'd be like oh my god i feel terrible anyway never mind things aren't perfect who cares it was done it was fun it took my mind off my legs still being tired the fact that we ran around kid did too well in the skiing and then qualified for another day so then i was like oh my god the third 4 30 a.m wake up he's broken i'm broken oh so they just keep rolling day after day so it's because it's every kid in france is wants to get through so they do the first leg the second leg the third leg he got through last day go, go he's going to the finals poor Bryn had got back at 10 o'clock from work and i'd said who do you want to take you and it's like dad i've not seen dad fair enough so i had to go uh, he literally flew in didn't even unpack his bag i was like by oh. the way by the way um sweet sweet cherry you're getting up <laughs> i'll get you up i've made the teas ready anyway they drove to with the um the resort where the race was was about an hour and a half away drove off i saw them off i thought i might go back to sleep but i didn't and then about an hour later my phone pinged it's cancelled are you joking? What a stupid sport. What do you mean it's cancelled? Okay, you might have seen on Instagram some videos of like the um, ski lifts. I think it's in Italy. Apps, they're like literally going round the wire. They're blowing and people are on them. People are sitting oh. on the ski lifts. Anyway, high wind. So I was like, yes, I don't want my child to be on that chair. No, he'd love it. And my mum and dad were like waiting to watch the YouTube link and everything. Yeah. And I was like, no. Nope. Not happening. Cancelled, done. Anyway, he he got over it. He got a gilet with like France ski stuff. Cancelled, cancelled or rescheduled? No, cancelled. they don't reschedule them. Cancelled because there's hardly any snow tough. left anyway. A week's okay. time. Yeah, it's tough. But anyway, he... No, it was... It was that was, must have been the Saturday. Um, I still had to do all the admin with the other kids who were still skiing, ice skating, everything. Then the Sunday, he wanted to play in this all-day football tournament. Okay, I'll do that. I'll take that one for the team. Got to get up again at six o'clock. Six o'clock? That's like a lion. I can do that. Got said child down to this. <laughs> oh, my God. And I was like, Bryn, this is... This is massive. There's 24 teams. This oh. isn't going to be done at lunchtime. Oh, my God. Oh, oh my God. Anyway, I knew. I didn't trust Bryn. I'd taken two flasks, loads of food. I was ready. I was ready for the day. I was just a bit lonely because um, most of the parents had just given their kids to the football coach. And I was like, oh. It's babysitting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there's off. no one to chat to. As the day went by, more people came. So it was a bit more chit-chatter. Anyway, said child was so exhausted, Gary. This is bad parenting but also very hard parenting because they want to do everything. And I couldn't have said, you can't go to the skiing and you can't go to the football. But yeah. he was like, he has this like mountain cough, which isn't gone. And he is just like, just, you can see him like, because he, he's a Sutton. So he gives absolutely everything to everything. So he's like, <gasps> like <laughs> up to every play. He's super striker. So they're like, give the ball, give the ball. If, if he gets the ball, he's going to score. If he's like, he's gonna, he spends enough yeah. time in the garden, smashing the neighbor's windows. Tournaments are different. The, the play is very short and quick. They're on like smaller pitches. The third match, I think, went to penalties. And it was actually the team that won in the finals eventually. And he grabbed the ball. Yeah, I'll take, first, yeah, 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 I'll take the first penalty. Before I got the chance to like even watch, he'd taken it and he missed. Oh. He missed. I mean, this is the kid that just spends four hours a day hitting a ball into he missed. It. Oh my gosh, he was absolutely distraught. Oh, I love absolutely it. He stood up. He got he the ball. Still, he was, I was like, oh, oh no. 
So he, oh, the tears. If I had that option, I'd have tried to disappear and kind of. There's more the to the this crowd. story. There's more okay. to the story. So he missed you. Coach was like, nice. I was like, I did exactly the same at your age. You know, we've all been there. We've all been there. This is what I love about kids sport. They were like, you know, it's all right, mate. It's all right. It's not so lovely. Anyway, the day went on and almost every match went to penalties and he just didn't have any luck. He just like every time. <laughs> anyway, then the last match they had, which was, I think, to be, I mean, it wasn't even in ninth place or something. They got a penalty and the team went, you've got to take it. You've got to take it. And he was like, okay. And I was like, oh my God, if he misses this, I'm not sure I can drive him home. The the amount of tears we'd had all day. And he's not like crying because he he's just exhausted. Anyway, he stepped up, he got the ball and I was like, well, kudos to you that you're going to, you've missed this many times today. You're still going to have a go. Anyway, he, uh, he did a great goal and he scored a goal. So that was a good, but we talked then a lot about on the way home. I love the debriefing cars with kids. I get the best chats from my kids in the cars because I make them talk to to me um or sit in silence and then they'll start talking because they're so bored but he said mom i think i rushed my penalties today i just wanted to get them done i was like yeah i didn't i didn't go yeah you did i was like maybe you need a mental strategy before you take them he's like yes that's what harry kane does i was like good enough harry kane so we went and then he of course he got the ball went outside started practicing his mental strategy. I haven't asked him about his mental strategy. I thought oh, perhaps that's something personal that you need. You don't need 10,000 people knowing about it on the podcast. And then because Gary, the next day we had to get up, oh, the clocks had gone back, hadn't they? So I had to get up at half past four to walk the dogs before we went to the next ski race, which was actually half past three. I thought I was going to die. That I was like, normally Eddie would run with the dogs. I was like, there's no way I'm running at half past three in the morning. In the, it was absolutely ooning it down with like this wet snow. Oh, so this is not great prep, Eddie, all these wake, early mornings. Wake, uh, wake said kid up again. We did say to him, you don't have to go. You don't have to go. But it was the leads are all like this was a big departmental race. He wanted to go. So we were like, okay, we'll go. Bryn and I decided to go together because we divide and conquer so much. And these were like, let's do this together. Let's be in this together. Thank God, because this was in a ski resort up 800 hairpins. And as we were approaching uh, the ski resort, a friend WhatsApp me, a, a good WhatsApp, by the way, for all the people who've messaged me about my WhatsApp <laughs> complaints, um, a good WhatsApp saying, be careful, the road's horrendous. And I was like, oh, I felt so sick because it's 5 a.m. in a car, driving around hairpins, only yeah. tea in my tummy. I was like, oh my God, I feel so sick. Fortunately, just behind the snowplow, but it was really skiddy. <gasps> Gary, I was clutching the handles and my butt cheeks. Like I was just like, <gasps> I'd be terrified. I was quite scared. And I'm not up, we drive in snow a lot, but we we just haven't driven in snow that much this year. Normally I just get non plus by it, but the car was sliding. I could feel, I could feel the wheels sliding. I was like, anyway, but we, by the time we got to the car park, it was light. It was only quarter to seven. Oh my God, who gets to a ski resort at quarter to seven on bank holiday Monday? Thousands and thousands of people coming to this race. And then the kids, they only had one run each. So if you only get one run, if you go last, you get the worst snow. So it's a bit like running down a hill, being timed running down a really greasy hill. If you get to go like, Fifth or sixth, you'd probably get a nice bit of grass. If you got to go two thousandths, yes, you'd probably it's go like, quite fast because you just it's slide like down cross like country, that. isn't it? The, the senior men just get the raw deal. It's cross country <laughs> because it's all just churned so up. So the kids got both their numbers, and I think they were like six hundred and fifty fourth and nine hundred and eighty two. And oh, oh my god. <laughs> This is not the day for us. Um, Bryn and I got up, went up. The the wind, we couldn't. We couldn't. We tried to find the kids at the top to find where the races were, but we couldn't. We didn't never been to the ski resort. We didn't know where they were. We could not see anything. We couldn't even see the piece. And I was like, "Hands up! Who's running two hundred miles in four days here?" <laughs> oh no, just me, just me. <laughs> the snow was awful. It was like lumpy, really thick. Like you had to drag your skis around. I was like dressed up like a mammoth, but I got so hot because it was such hard work to ski down the the stress of we couldn't find the kids we didn't know where they'd gone i was like i just hope my eight-year-old is with a ski coach somewhere on this piece we got down brim was like i don't think you should do that again i was like no no i'm just gonna stand at the bottom so i stood at the bottom found um where evie's piece was gonna finish and they were on ski number 480 or something and she was 685 i was at Absolutely freezing. Each oh. run takes about a minute. And I was like, I guess I just stand here then, guy. <laughs> Do the maths. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh my <God. laughs> I tried to make it like interesting. Like I'd be like, OK, let's see. Let's work out because you had like a timing thing. So I was like, 
I can tell which kids are going fast because I can tell by the time I knew the whole piece. Anyway, I stood there for about an hour losing the will. My tea flask had gone and then Bryn suddenly appeared down this red, really steep red piece with loads of horrible snow. And he'd carried me a cup of tea and put a cup on the top, <laughs> a hot cup of tea. I was like, I don't, I don't know, oh, but star. I think that is the best thing you've ever He's a keeper, me. that one. Look at that. It was, and the women, the women like ski coaches that were standing at the bottom were like, oh, where did you get that? I was like, no, no, no. Are you talking about my husband or my tea? Because both, they're not for sale. Anyway, oh, Gary. So by the time that was done, neither of the kids had a great... Obviously, poor Rory was just... He said, my legs. When we got back in the car, he said, I think I'm too tired for football, mum. I've never had that in my life. He was proper, proper tired. That is a little insight into what was a mad Easter weekend. We didn't see our house. We did hardly saw our bed. And then the next child is going off tonight. So he was like, right, mum, we've got to go and get my skis. He's going to ask like, oh, my God. This is the worst sport, I think. We were, Bryn and I were like saying, what is, what could be like, maybe being a swim mum, like when you have to get up at like 5am every morning to take your kids to swim training and then sit on the side of the pool, that would be pretty rubbish. One of my friends said, oh, their brother was a professional cycle racer. And that's really rubbish too, to be a parent at, because you li- they literally come past you. <laughs> and then they go, <laughs> at least with swimming, it's inside. It's kind of, there is temperature that. might be okay. The yeah. temperature, the, the smell of the chlorine. We, yeah, we just were like, this is, this is too much. Anyway, it's done now. The ski season is so nearly over. Thank goodness. And it's stuff that it was adventures. It was adventures. The kids, that's the sort of stuff the kids won't remember, but all the time. I was thinking, there's my race gone. This is my race gone because I've not prepped anything. I feel awful. I feel so tired. I've got a sore throat. Um, that is a full on week. My can I just me. not go, Gary? Can I just not go? I'll put a blonde wig on. I'll do it for you. <laughs> can you just do it for me? <laughs> I don't feel fresh. Well, anyway. well, Annie, I love listening to your stories. You can <laughs> oh tell God. a story. <laughs> anyway, I did do some running. I did do my last long run. I did my gym sessions. I did one last steady hill uh, run, which felt good. I feel absolutely fine in my body, but my poor, tired head and eyes tell a different tale. We've got a juggle. It's the whole juggle, you know, unfortunately. Well, fortunately, my life's pretty rich. I do love it. But yeah, there's lots of outside influences. Yeah, I'm complaining about taking my kids to all these very expensive sports. So I totally get the absolute um, that I'm so lucky that I've got kids that want to do sport, that do the sport and that learn so much from it. And I think as well, like there's something in me having like when I see my kids battle, through tough times learn stuff that gives me so much for races as well that I'm like I can't be weak I can't I've got to show up I've got to even if it goes wrong I've got to give it my all because I spend every day telling my kids to show up do your best do your best well done the penalty I don't think there's many sports where you are the center of attention like a footballer taking a penalty and to keep standing up and going again and going again (laughs) I'll be thinking about that that's awesome (laughs) Oh, I love it. Right. Come on then. Let's talk running as this was meant to be a running podcast and slowly has become more and more about. (laughs) Well, it's the first full week of taper and typically I overdid it. Uh, Too many miles, basically a bit annoyed with myself. This is where I, you know, my outside influences little Rexy. I see Rex's miles are just like rubbish, stoppy, starty miles. So the actual plan, I think, was 70 miles, but when you factor in little dog jogs, ended up being more like 80. So yeah, took my eye off the ball. For your future training, how can I juggle all of this? And he needs a run, he needs to go out. And that is always going to be a bit of a negative effect on the total load I do for the week. It's, you know, as, as much as they are easy, it's still time out on my feet. Yeah, and your dog isn't like my dogs in that I can pretty much do all my runs with my dogs, even like efforts and stuff, because they yeah. can just the lead. Yeah. Yours are just wrecks. Dear little Rexy, he's got to be stay close to you. I can do, I've done strides with him, short, slow trail runs, but anything with any kind of structure, it's just a big no-go. So yeah, I do end up doing a lot of extra miles and that's just the way it is. But workout-wise, yeah, 20 minutes at threshold pace. And for me, that is 6.30s, roughly 6.30 per mile. I found that super tough going into the wind. Where we live, there's an industrial estate and it's quite exposed. Yeah, when you turn certain corners, you just feel like you're hitting that just a, a solid headwind. And even though, you know, it's only three miles, like 20 minutes, that should be really easy. But yeah, I just found that like another, every time I go on the treadmill, 
it's an awesome workout. Every time I hit the roads, it's a real bruising workout. So yeah, didn't hit 630s, I don't think, for any any of those miles. And I'm all trying to reflect <laughs> back. I know I'm looking back at old workouts, old sessions, old marathon pace Ooh. runs. And yeah, there's a trend actually. I've never ever just successfully done a long run with marathon pace. Lots of workouts have went fine over the past. So yeah, it's this coming up to Manchester. Wow, my head is absolutely fried. But treadmill session, I needed a boost. So I hit the treadmill session midweek. Uh, and I think I was like 10 minutes at uh, 10k pace and then five times a k. Smashed it. Yeah, I always smash it on the treadmill. Something. <laughs> There's a mystery, the treadmill. We did a park run. Went did a park run on Saturday, celebrating a good friend, Ray. He's done 400 park runs and he's volunteered wow. well over 100 times. And this even impressed Esme. Esme's like... So they're like, it's a park run every week. You do the maths. It's like, yes, it's like over 10 years of park run. And so kudos, kudos, Raza. Yeah, lovely, sunny, chatty, miles, perfect Sunday morning. Couple with a cheese gone in the end. £4.20. <laughs> Sorry for the dates. I think it's your, when you're talking about, you're talking about how much, how expensive your coffee is where you live. But £4.20 for a lovely cheese gone, a cuppa with a refill. Oh, a refill. We all know as runners the importance of a refill, don't we? Because one cup is just like a, it's just a lip moistener. Two cups. Yeah, it's just a starter. You just down that, refresh. Then you enjoy the second one. Oh, get me down there, Gareth. Get me down there. It's a good, good scone it was too. Long run on Sunday with some marathon paced miles. Again, I just found it really hard, hard work. And where we live in Dalton Park, or just near where we live in Dalton Park, um, it's a basically, it's a, it's a one mile long run road. So I'll run in one direction, turn around and come back the other way. But it was super, so windy that I had to just do those marathon efforts one on, one off, because again, that just would have bruised me. And I just feel my watch is like, this GPS of judgment. It's like really, I see the I see the miles beeping, and yeah, I'm hitting the marathon pace miles, but yeah, they they are tough. But this is, I think, hopefully, this is again. I've been looking back at old workouts. The heart rate that I could achieve achieve, say, at Valencia, which is probably my last serious marathon, is a lot higher than what I'm achieving in these marathon effort runs. So what I'm taking for that, and I could be wrong, you probably correct me. I'm basically really super tired when I'm doing these runs. So I'm struggling. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. It's like you've done a lot of stuff before <laughs> and not had much rest. And Yes. Yes. So when I look at, say, Valencia, and my average heart rate for that was about 150 beats. So that's about three years ago. So minus three beats off that. I was not in any of those marathon splits, marathon pace splits, did my heart rate get to 100 47 beats. So similar effort to what I was going at Valencia. So hopefully, yeah, when I'm a bit fresher, I can just push myself a bit more. We'll, we'll see. My goodness we'll see if you actually unru- rest. <laughs> but what I found was really annoying. This is why my bloody hit my garment at the moment. It just completely lies to me. So it tells me after my marathon pace run on Sunday, oh, you've got a new VO2 max of 63, which on the face of it, that's awesome. I Googled what that would be for a marathon. That's roughly a two- 235, I think, for a marathon. Nice. Which... I love it. Okay. Yep. Let's do this. <laughs> I'd be super, I'd be super pleased with that. But the same. We watch... would all be, well, we'd be questioning oh, your use of me. external <laughs> aids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd do anything, Eddie, honestly. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I wonder how many. I'm not, I would not do this. No, oh, don't let's go down there. Well, how many Middle people who have drugs? basically middle aged men with disposable income do it? And, and cheat in a nutshell. I don't know. Yeah, you know, just throwing that out there. But yeah, would you? 60... Haven't we asked this before? Like, would you if someone said, you take, no one will know? Oh my well, God. No, no, no. Well, I think there is potential health. <laughs> there is health risk, isn't there? So if you could, yeah, you know, you buy some shoes, there's really no risk to that. Um, if the other things like uh, caffeine and things, you know, they're tried and tested and there's no risk. But with performance enhancing drugs, I think there is some long term. Would you take risks. it? Would you mind though? Would you be like, I'll take the risk just for that 252? No, no, not for the <laughs> for 252. <laughs> 235, I might. <laughs> not for 252. But the same watch that tells me I've got a VO2 max of 63. Then if you go into the dates on this on the device, it says I've got a marathon predicted time with 345. So what the hell? I is think that? your watch is right. I think it's telling you. I think 345 is probably closer good, than two. Solid day out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm a you know a bit annoyed. I overdid it with the miles, but no fitness to begin. Mentally, 
again. I've been up and about for the past few weeks, uh, but now it's like, you know, we're literally banging on the door. Bit of a tough week. Easter. Yeah, I really enjoyed Easter actually. Back off Lent, trying to not go berserk. Family breakfast, lots of finished bread, cheese, yogurts, a little bit too much chocolate. And once I popped the top, that is it. I just really uh, struggled <laughs> to, to control myself. I always think oh, I'm going to have a, just, Lisa could just have. Yeah, I just have a little square with a cup of tea most nights. Little God, square. Just you made me that. sick. I can't do that. I, I can't do that. <laughs> Don't worry. Do that. Prince had a very interesting um, article about Doritos. This is going to, if you're a Dorito fan, you might not want to listen yeah. to this. That said they, they have literally zero nutritional value. In fact, they make sure they have no nutritional value. So what the taste the flavoring that they put on makes you want to eat more and more but it never satiates you so that you just can't stop eating them because they never fill you up so that's why things like Dor- pringles doritos once you pop you can't stop Brian argued that that said actually when i eat a king size bag of doritos i do feel quite full up at the end of it so i would say I was dying. <laughs> <laughs> is that why when you eat something really healthy sometimes if i yeah exactly fruit salad, it's you, just like you, you feel full don't you if you yes. have chicken and potatoes and vegetables you're like yeah that's me done i don't want another actually i could always eat another parsnip i'll have a parsnip it's tricky that way Come on, what's the overall stats then? The overall stats, yeah, 80 miles should have been 70 miles. So do you know who Joey Swall is on in, on YouTube? Mm. Well, his 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 catchphrase <laughs> That's basically what I'm is. My kids say to me. <laughs> you know, the, there was a famous footballer at the football tournament. Mum, he's on YouTube, and I was like. Oh, you guys are so cute. Well, he always says at the end of his videos, you need to do better. Oh no, I don't think that's a nice way to finish. Anyway, a bit more, uh, bit more focus. Bit more, well, just a bit more kindness, maybe. You need to do better. Oh, no. That's what he says. Got to put that above <laughs> the kids' doors. <laughs> uh, this week's Brew of the Coaches, we talk about, yeah, staying safe when out running. It's not just the trails, it could be urban areas too. This week's Brew the Coaches question is anonymous. What advice do the coaches have for keeping safe on the trails and also keeping safe in more urban environments? I'm sure we can all think of numerous times we might have been vulnerable and had something unexpected happen. Yeah, super important question. Two factors, you know, being physically vulnerable and keeping yourself as safe as possible on the trails. Russell, yeah, do you want to kick us off with this one? Yeah, so it is a is a great question, and um, and it's something that I've had to wake up to in the past few years. I used to be really arrogant. Um, I know the hills, especially around me, really well, and I'm quite a fit guy, quite experienced in the mountains, and so I used to never take kit. Kit really annoys me, slows me down. Just you know, always feels a bit more cumbersome than when you just manage to get out zero kit. But um, yeah, the, the the thing that woke me up to it was a guy called Chris Smith, who used to be a close friend of mine, and he was out for a really simple training run in Scotland, and um, unfortunately he didn't come back. And um, he was a really good runner, GB International. He's won Raza Widfa here. Um, I would say at the time of his death, he was probably the top five mountain runner in the UK. He was that good, so that woke me up in a way that I might not have um, otherwise. That this could happen to anyone. The weather in the mountains changes so quickly, even on a nice sunny day. I always take kit now. I always take um, a bivy bag, um, extra layers and some food, water, and just make sure that I've told someone where I'm going. And and I recommend that to all the athletes that I coach as a minimum, um, as a bare minimum, but probably, you know, even more than that, like an extra really warm layer um, because it's just going to take a while for people to get out and, and reach you. Um, mountain rescue is mainly voluntary based. You can't always rely, especially if you're going out in summer um, when it's really busy and they get a lot of calls. You, you could be waiting a long time. There's no fallback. There's no safety rope a lot of the time. And you could end up really waiting um, a, a long period when things can go really, really badly, really quickly. I would ignore social media sometimes. I'm probably guilty of it too, but sharing spectacular images of where I've been running and playing on the trails. And that is quite seductive. I've seen many a 
image of Crib Gok and uh, it's probably sent quite a few people, not me personally, but yeah, probably quite a few people have gone over these places, gone to these places where maybe they shouldn't or maybe not quite ready for. But yeah, I think definitely echoing what you said, take the kit, even if it's not for you. I have bumped into a high crew, tripped and uh, had a fracture and I had to give them my bivy bag just to keep warm until Mountain Rescue come up. And you made a great point. The time when I came off Hike Up Nick, that walker was at least on their own for an hour. Oh, with with somebody else, I didn't leave them on their own. But there was two people there and they weren't moving in the cold for over an hour. Yeah, really good, really good points. And communicate. If I'm on my own, 100%, yeah, Lisa knows what I'm doing. Yeah, I don't actually go in the snow on my own anymore. Just too dangerous. I always either have a friend or I just leave it that day just um, because of the risk. Uh, it it's often fine and that's the problem with it. It's so seductive and then you come back and you feel like a legend. But yeah, if something goes wrong, just a twisted ankle can completely change your outcome. Put your kid on as well. Gary and I, we made some, so we were when we were wrecking last week. We knew the weather was coming in, so we put the kit on, but neither of us put our big warm gloves on. And uh, well, you had your big warm gloves on, but they had massive holes in. Uh, and we were like, it's only seven miles. We can get back. We can, we'll just run this in now. And we were on borderline of very, very cold by the time we finished. Like if one of us had tripped and uh, and then we'd had to stop, the others would have been pretty useless because we were all really cold. And it was just because we were being lazy and not putting it on because we just wanted to get it done. And we also stopped fueling. And I think that's a really big thing, like keeping yourself safe on the trails katie car saberstein taught me this she was like make note we had once we skied toured together and i fell really badly and we were landing on this like ice uh piece we couldn't get up we couldn't get our skis back on she's like okay let's not make any big decisions this is what i always do when i'm in the mountains something goes wrong let's have a snack let's eat let's get our blood sugar up and get our energy up and then we'll decide what we're going to do so always take enough food as well so that you can make good decisions and just like russell i very rarely. I mean, I, it's tricky here. I get, I can get high and get in the mountains. I do go a lot on my own, but I will always carry like pretty much a full mandatory kit for a race, even because like we all know the weather, like the weather can change. You also need to check the weather before you go. Um, don't, don't look out the window. Everyone's like, oh, you just look out the window to see the weather. But in the, anywhere like the Lake District or, any, or anything, you can set out. And if you're doing a long run in the hills, it's probably going to be four or five hours. The weather will change. It might be blue sky, but the last two hours could be in rain. Always, always carry full waterproofs, a base layer, gloves, a bivy bag, 500 calories, some food, uh, a battery pack so that you can charge your phone because your iPhone, my iPhone doesn't last a day. You, ridiculous. Um, and put it all into a waterproof bag inside your rucksack so that when you go to get it, if it has rained, it is dry as well so that you can put dry kit on. And as the others have said, you, probably you, you're not going to need it, but the person, you might come across somebody or if you're with somebody you can help somebody uh stay warm it's all about yeah not just yourself but looking out after other people as well it's a good point eddie sometimes i feel safety in numbers but if somebody in your little crew twists an ankle or they're walking or even worse than that then yeah it slows everybody down also don't be scared to be the dick in your group i've done this as well my friends will laugh when they're listening to this when i've gone put your jacket on Put your jacket on. The rain's coming in. No, I can't be bothered. Put it on because I don't want to be the one next to you with hypothermia and running really slow. Or eat. You need to eat because you're starting to slow us down <laughs> or you're feeling <laughs> sick. So you need to eat. You know, look after each other as well. Don't and don't be scared to be the one that goes, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my jacket on. I can see the rain coming. Or I think we should drop down because the, the weather's coming in. So don't be afraid to be more Russell. Yeah, and be the one uh, I come across as like you know quite alpha and arrogant. You know, I get that, but <laughs> I always say to my group that if I go out into the hills in bad weather before we go, there's not going to be any like measuring dick contests here. Okay, if the weather gets bad, we're all getting off the hill, and I don't care if I'm the one who has to call it. And it's normally when people get tired and then under fuel that they make the wrong decisions and yeah. make things harder for themselves. Yeah. And so you, you have to have somebody hopefully that can just say, look, this is not fun anymore and we need to get off quickly. 
but yeah so and and often people don't want to hear it when you say it because they've already gone too far they're too cold to make rational decisions or too underfueled yeah i mean i've i've, I've been in quite a few um dodgy situations <laughs> should I say um well from mostly when I was in the army but uh but I think I think it's pre- I think the, the key thing is as as runners and particularly mountain runners we we all like a bit of type 2 fun like I mean for me personally that's why I'm there you know I'm I'm not there for I, I'm there for for full on type 2 fun and um, and that's a lot Line, isn't it? It's also, it's you're treading a fine line when you're pushing and when you're doing hard stuff, and you don't want to take away from that because otherwise, you know, it's not it's not the rush that you want from it. I think the key thing though is understanding your own capability, and um, you know, like Russell was saying, not not being arrogant about your uh, what you can do and what you can't do, you know, and knowing when you're out when you are outside of your comfort zone, and particularly in a group, being able to spot when other people are out of their comfort zone, and that's from my experience in terms of mountaineering groups. That's a really and, and just running as well. That's a really key one. Being able to spot when someone is, um, they might not think they're out of their comfort zone, but actually you can see that if things start to change, then things are going to go wrong. So I would I would say one of the key things about be, be, being out and staying safe on the trails is you have to be thinking, so what? What happens if this? What happens if that? You need to be, think of it as chess, and you need to be two or three steps ahead of any situation and think, am I still comfortable? At what point am I not comfortable? But you need to be ahead of the game there, three steps ahead. So when that moment comes, you know that's your hard line as to when you're not comfortable. At the end of the day, we all love what we do, but we if we, you know, you can only make memories at the end of the day if, um, and have that great type two fun if you come off the mountain. So at the end of the day, you've got to come off the mountain and that's the key thing. I've just seen on there as well, they've talked about keeping safe in urban environments. Do you guys want to talk about that? Bryn came on the podcast a long time ago, a couple of years ago, and he did a really good chat because this is his, uh, this is his skill set. Uh, I'll try and find what number it is and we'll pop it in the show notes. But he talked about how you, what you can do in urban environments when you go around, especially as a woman, to feel safe, what you can do before you go, what you can do afterwards. But I remember pulling something from it that he was very good at saying if it doesn't you don't feel comfortable trust your gut if you don't feel throat punch it (laughs) sorry (laughs) if you don't feel if you don't feel comfortable throat punch it (laughs) okay you didn't say that but um (laughs) really well for me that's a charm (laughs) <laughs> it's great punch. We, run <laughs> we're not endorsing violence on the tea and trails podcast but something that uh Bryn did say uh is that we are very good as humans of if you don't feel safe something doesn't feel right you don't feel comfortable get out of there make yourself safe nearly always when we're running we if we suddenly feel like this isn't right why is that person there it is normally right that you know perhaps the, the, their intentions might be completely opposite to what we think but just being aware and something that Bryn always says is do not we shouldn't but do not listen to things in your ears if you're running in an environment that you don't feel safe in the only other thing um, i would add is um for men as well and i got this for my sisters um and i've never had to consider this at all is if you're running and it's dark and there's a woman on the same side of the street as you you can just cross the road and that can often just give them such a relief from, and i would never have thought about that but it just makes it more obvious that you're not a threat. And if all men knew that, that's an option. But I, I'm often not threatened by men running because they're not the threat to me. Because if you're a man out running, you're much more interested in your average Strava pace um, or looking good. You know, that I, I don't know if Trish and Rebecca feel the same, but I don't find another man running... Okay, um, if a man's walking, then he can still yeah. If, the if it's if it's a man walking, especially yeah. if it's a man walking without a dog, mm. I'm always a That's bit great. like, oi, oi, what are you? Why are you here? I look for the dog, and um, but I actually don't normally feel threatened by. Probably like Bryn would be like, well, you should, you should, you should, you should. But um, is there anything any any of you would do if it was a 
not a, an urban environment, but maybe you're going away for a work trip or something and it was a new location. Strava heat maps is really good because it shows where everybody runs. Um, so you're probably going to pull out there a route that is probably well run, well trod. There'll be lots of people, pretty, pretty safe. The terrain will be safe. And you can then create a route and share it, or you can Garmin live where you're running so that you can tell your partner or perhaps um, work colleague where you're running. And I would try and run in the daylight as much as possible. Flight or flight looks like you're a fight, Trish. I'll be, I'll be flight. <laughs> be out there. If you see Trish, I think Matt, you're a man running and you see Trish, I would just, I'll be just put my your hands up. I'm safe. I'm safe, Trish. You're in your safe place. I think particularly for women, it is, it's not something I've ever worried about. And that's probably because of background, but I, and I know, and I, I didn't appreciate um, friends of mine, how much it does affect women running on their own. And particularly that that safety that's a, it's a big thing in women's running like a lot of people a lot of strong confident women that i know do worry about running on at night or in areas that they're not too sure or you know if someone's shouting from a car i mean if someone shouted in a car at me i'd shout at them back and chase them down the road <laughs> This is where but Bryn would I, say, don't engage, Trish. Yeah. <laughs> really can take that rage. Don't engage. Don't engage. I, but I, I would say just one thing it, that definitely does make a difference, I think, is running with confidence. So generally, people who are looking to, you know, cause some kind of trouble are looking for a weakness. Per perception is a lot of thing. And if you're moving with confidence, if you look confident, people are less likely, in my experience, to engage with with you but you know if the worst case scenario absolutely throat punch run you go you if you're running in an urban environment as well you've got shops you've got hotels you've got restaurants never be scared to duck into um one of those you don't have to say anything even if you're not feeling safe go where the people are and uh, and if you really don't feel safe then make contact as i always say to my kids find another mum Find another mum with a pram and uh, and make contact. Is that pram safe? <laughs> pram safe. <laughs> Rebecca, have you got anything to add? Obviously, everyone said uh, lots of really good points already. I think definitely um, being well prepared, carrying kit, um, so preparation, and then avoiding that plan A mentality of I've set out to do this run, I'm going to do this run at all costs. I think that that's the biggest thing is being adaptable when we're out there. So that's adaptable to how we're feeling. Uh, adaptable to the conditions and have those escape routes planned alternative ways back all of those sorts of things um because yeah i think people can get into issues if they are committed to doing something which then on the day just doesn't isn't possible because of weather or, or how they're feeling and for as fit and as strong as as some runners are um nobody goes fast with a broken bone or a sprained ankle everyone goes at the same speed once you're injured um and you need to plan for that slowest possible speed you'll be moving at which could be stationary for some hours as people have said uh, whilst you're waiting for help um so yeah that those would be my sort of closing points really just to summarize the biggest thing we should have said rebecca is what we should all do and which i do every two years is take an outdoor first aid course yeah um, so that you are so boring oh my god so you need to find friends to do it with and then they're mm. hilarious and then they're the most fun you've ever my had my friends don't do first aid courses well there you go you know you need to i'll go i'll go friends. on with you russell i'll bandage you up oh it's with tonight tampons and sanitary oh, towel. <laughs> just find friends who are medics just yeah. find friends that are medics and then that's it <laughs> yes or always run with rebecca and then yeah. but don't uh, yeah. we, we laugh but if you don't have any medical experience and you you wouldn't know what to do real basic first aid of getting somebody warm isolating an injury the recovery position very basic stuff you could save somebody's life not your own you know you're doing your bit if you come across somebody on a trail or you've got a friend i i cannot i have done so much first aid over especially living in the mountains of ski i mean every time i go skiing somebody does something in front of me and i'm like oh god i'm gonna have to stop you're actually crying your leg is hanging off 
but um, I have confidence in my ability that I can at least make them safe. And that's all you want to do as a first aider, isn't it, Rebecca? I can make them safe until the pistas or the paramedics arrive. So I think if you are going to be running in a place where the jeopardy is high for injuries in the mountains, then you do your bit for mountain rescue as well. I reckon you'd get a much nicer reception from mountain rescue as well if you are more well prepared and you've done a little bit than if you're out there in a bikini with a twisted ankle in minus 10. We'll be sitting down with the coaches again soon. So if you're a patron and have a question, pop it over to hello at tntrails.com. Do you know you can set up a emergency response on your Garmin so that if your Garmin is smashed or hits yes. the deck really hard, it can start an alarm? If you don't know this, it's very much worth you. It's super easy to do, but you need to do it via the Garmin app on menu and person. And how does that work then? Will it send an SOS to the police or yes, a friend? Yes, you choose somebody. I think you can choose four people. So it's really good. So I've got a couple of running friends. So obviously my hubby is the best, is the best. He is the best. Yeah. Uh, he's my first line of, um, he's my first, what was it? Emergency contact. And then I, I, we just shared it in our running WhatsApp group to go. I chose my most organized friend. <laughs> <laughs> Not the one that never answers the phone. I'm like, I think I think it. So you can have four people that you alert, which is really good. So if you, I, I, why would you not set that up? Because even if it was an accident, smash it your. It does go off quite a lot. Up. I remember Robbo. He's got his set on his watch, and it does ring quite a few. It does, it does go off. Does sometimes it? When, oh, I've never yeah. even heard mine go off. It's so. when he's hit the deck. He has hit the deck on a trail. Yeah. I think might might be we're coming off Hallsfeld Ridge, and I'm sure he fell over. And I'm going to add you to my contacts actually, and then Northern Traverse every time I fall off. Oh, down yeah. Climbs. <laughs> You're like, she's fallen again. I'm fine. I'm fallen again. <laughs> Have you got the little button on your GPS so you press it? Oh, yeah, don't go near that button. I remember. Oh, I was like, I was absolutely paranoid when I did the spine that something might press it. James Noble joins us this week to share his Silver Northern Traverse wisdom. Hopefully it helps not just Northern Traverses, but anyone taking on a massive challenge. We are delighted to welcome back James Nobles, as we said, just as we were chatting to him. People don't often get invited back, but we're a big fan. We've often we often drop his name in conversation, don't we, Gary? Because we're super fans. Winner of both the Dragons Back and the Northern Traverse, and so near yet so far, almost spine finisher. Too early, too early to joke about that. Too early yeah. to joke about the photo of yeah. the testosterone crossing the. Too early. It's <laughs> <laughs> it done. We've got loads of stuff to chat about. Uh, we last talked to you. We had a scroll back. My goodness, episode six when you won the dragons back. So much has happened since then. Uh, you actually turned up to the Zoom this time and on time. So we made a. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you again james thank you it's really lovely to, uh, to see both of you two and to, to have another chat and uh yeah make, make the most of the time we've got this time rather than being late <laughs> well we ask all our guests where are you what's the view from your window and have you been for a run today the view doesn't change from mine it's boring i work from home um so i can see the pavement outside and the garden but at least it's a nice sunny day uh so i'm down in cheltenham and i have been on a run today i had a uh, pretty decent hill session uh, first thing this morning so uh Ooh. i've got it done it's in the bag um you can just enjoy that feeling now for the rest of the day so you're back training then proper full-time sessions long runs i was supposed to start long running at the weekend but um I couldn't stump the uh, motivation to do it, but I have definitely started with some of the actual proper sessions. So there, the hill training's back, the uh, the speed work's back, the long runs are not yet back, but they are <laughs> going to be this weekend. Are you? I'm really curious. Are you a coached athlete, James, or self coached? No, self coached. Self coached. Um, yeah, I've had a chat. Yeah, I just don't feel the need. I don't think to to be coached. I, I think you enjoy, I've seen some of your spreadsheets, the process of planning your own preparation, the time you have the time and the mental space to do that. And I think you love that as much as the race, like that is a big part of your preparation, isn't it? Of like... I reckon we'll chat about preparation today, but yeah, I, I certainly, uh, certainly go hard on the prep front and I'm, I'm not afraid of an Excel spreadsheet. So um, yeah, I just, I haven't pulled one together yet, but I need to, I need to pull one together for the plans that come up this year and then. 
once that's in place, like it's just a case of ticking them all off. How we've got to ask it, sorry, how are you doing after the spine race, James? Enough time passed. No, do you know what? I was actually uh, whilst I joke about it being too early, it's not too early at all. Like I, I was pretty beaten up on like for uh, the day or so afterwards. Like that's when I was like really just disappointed. Like I'd spent the best part of nine months training for that one race. Uh, and to see that it not it wasn't finished um, and to pull out at, um, just before Alston, it was gutting. But I didn't really have, in my mind, I didn't really have a choice. I wasn't going to like limp my way to the finish. That wasn't the kind of race that I wanted to have. So it was out of my control. And once I've kind of processed that, I yeah. felt quite comfortable with the decision like a couple of days later. It was just more annoying that I've got this. I have to do it. I have to do it again. And you must have seen um, Jasmine talk about that as well, saying, and and you must have felt the same as well, thinking, oh, no, I've got to go through all of that <laughs> <laughs> again. But you've got to. We wouldn't, we wouldn't think, we, we, we would we'd expect nothing less than you going, yeah, I've got to do that again. Well, I said, to, I said to my wife directly afterwards, like this is in the hours after making the decision to uh, stop. I was like, that is far too long for like the human body to go. And yeah. I said, I was like, I'm never ever doing a race of that distance again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 24 hours further down the line, I uh, I am absolutely adamant I'm doing it again. So uh, <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. And what was the problem? Don't want to kind of labour on it too much. Was it tendons in your foot? Is that correct? Yeah. So I thought it was um I thought it was a fracture. Um, but I'd had a couple of X-rays, and it turns out that it was just it was like tendonitis on one of the the tendons on the top of my foot. And I think the symptoms are really similar between that and a fracture. It was debilitating, really. Like, it was not not good at all. Is Has that the first time that's presented itself or is this something that's happened previously? It's the, it's the first time it's happened on that, like, on that foot in that place. But I also okay. got, I think it was, like, peroneal tendonitis in the... Um, in the Northern Traverse, I managed, I was able to manage it on the Northern Traverse and I wasn't able to manage it um, on the spine. I don't know why that was. I just kind of numbed my foot in the Northern Traverse to the point where I obviously couldn't feel anything. I was like, I'm getting, getting to the end. But, uh, but I think I'm, probably as well, maybe when it started hurting in the Northern Traverse, the end was a lot closer in sight maybe than in Alston. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Like my... And, I, I just got my shoes like all wrong on the Northern Traverse. I had my laces way too tight. So I started feeling the stabbing pain going down. It was both feet I got it in. And this was before we'd got through the Lake District. So I then had to numb my feet from like Shap all the way through to the end. Uh, and I only realized in Richmond that the problem was because I had my shoelaces too tight. And as soon as I let like the, the tension out of my shoelaces, it got a hell of a lot better. Oh very, my very God, quickly. But I don't think I has I didn't have that option on the spine. Like I don't think like I wouldn't have been able to like um release okay. the tension in my shoes and it would have gone away. It was it was there on every single step in every direction. So that's a that's a good tip is uh is, is make sure your shoelaces aren't too tight. <laughs> It's awesome. You know, we think people have got it sussed. But yeah, <laughs> no, <even. laughs> no. But I like, I like it. I like hearing because I'll pull on that, James. If I do get like something hurting, I'll be like, James ran all of this in pain. So if he could do that, you could do that. I like hearing story because you think you see. You know, you've, I've seen the pictures of you winning and stuff, and you think you don't see the suffering. You you don't see the suffering. You know, the closest we get is, yeah, a black and white grainy picture. But then for you to vocalise and go, actually, I was in quite a lot of pain and I managed it. It's good. I like hearing that sort of stuff because it just gives me like, you just like the empathy and you like knowing, yeah, you, you are going to be in pain. It's going to hurt. And it's the pain management of these big races. It's who can take the pain and keep moving. Oh God. Yeah, but I, I don't think, it, I don't think like the pain I felt was completely like avoidable so it's not like you have to be there no I had bad shoe choice bad tension in my uh, shoelaces and my socks were just my foot care was terrible in the non traverse so I learned for the spine that I need to look after my feet a lot better it's tricky isn't it shall we jump into northern traverse are you ready Gary do you want to ask anything else since last time we spoke James you and that well you're now a sponsored athlete <gasps> on Tin and Lecky Pauls how yeah how did that come about and 
my dream to be a sponsored athlete, James. But yeah, what's the reality like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was great. It was. It, it is. Re- it is good. It's very good for lots of reasons. In like, the kit is obviously brilliant from Monte, but it also gives you the opportunity to like try kits out that you probably have never tried before i just i think that bit is phenomenal and with montaigne as well so they didn't approach me like i got in touch with them because well one i loved all of the kit that they do and two i think they they organize or are involved in a lot of the really big uh races that i've been interested in so i got in touch with them and i had a chat with them and said look is there any chance like you might be willing to take on one more runner and then we just had conversations and it went from there and it's been brilliant ever since like lecky is is a really recent one so i met them at the national running show and i just had a had a chat with them there too and um again like they're, they're brilliant poles so like there's there's nothing that's not to like in uh, yeah yeah in kind of working with these sorts of brands. I'm not sponsored uh, by Scarpa um, at the moment. Um, but who, who, oh, I thought who you were. Sorry. What might, what might happen? Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's easy when uh, when they just they all do really good stuff. So yes, it's a it's a good good step forward. I wanted to catch up with you, James. Love you. Love love what you stand for. But also, I want to. I want to pick your brains about Northern Traverse. This will be going out the day before Northern Traverse. You might be listening to this as you're doing Northern Traverse. <laughs> you never know. Um, or Lakes Traverse or any of the smaller races. And I did reach out to you when I was planning my recce, which very kindly, you have always been really um, generous with your time. I asked you <laughs> stupid questions about bat, what bags to use, poles to use. I've taken screenshots of photos of you. This sounds like a stalker. It's not a <laughs> what you're carrying. But hearing it straight from you um i know it's going to help me and and also help others perhaps maybe not just northern traverse but people thinking about doing mega events just and it might be just a mega event to you um uh little bits of lessons that you've you've already shared a little bit of lessons learned so that you don't have to make these mistakes or also as i said like you can emphasize and say yep we've all been there we've all done that i thought we could start with bit of kit chat the mandatory kit for the northern traverse isn't massive especially i'm coming from the spine and you've gone to the spine so you must have been like you must have been like holy hell this backpack and i'm like this is the this backpack <laughs> but i got space i can put some more cookies in the the kit's not massive but i have heard that it does it does get quite cold still overnight so did you take anything extra did you change anything extra that perhaps people might think about putting in their kit bag or perhaps eddie might think about <laughs> i think spring like well is it it is spring isn't it like just term spring um, just about I think- it's a really like difficult one to try and pack for. So I, in preparation for the Northern Traverse, so I wasn't um, sort of supported by Monte at that time. I didn't have like um, a really good waterproof coat. So I ended up, I bought like a Gore-Tex Pro coat because I was like, it could at that time yeah. of year, just lash it down the whole time. Um, and luckily, like it didn't end up doing that. So I just went for like kind of a lighter weight waterproof coat. But I had that in my drop bag just in case like the weather changed and things took a turn for the worst. I was like, I want to be as waterproof as I possibly can be to to carry on. So I do think it's worth having maybe like, given the time of year that this is at, I do think it's worth having like a decent waterproof coat either on you or in your drop bag because you do get access to your drop bag quite a lot. Um, but I use then, as you say, like the, the kit list isn't that extensive for the non I think it's just about right. Like you don't, Everything that you carry, you pretty much use it all. I did think that. I thought at one point, I reckon I'm going to be wearing all this kit, so this backpack's not going to wear anything yeah. because yeah, yeah. there's pretty much everything. Like when you carry your spine kit, it never gets any lighter because you start in all the kit, which you're never going to take off, are you? And then everything is like you t- tools that you need <laughs> rather than... <laughs> the, <Like> shovels. <laughs> Um, whereas this is kit that I was thinking yeah I reckon come the evening I think I'm going to put a lot of this on yeah Um, I got so on our second night so it was when we were kind of going through the um, the North York Moors it was freezing that night it was kind of like spine cold because you have to have like is it like a 300 gram insulation or something yeah like Um, like I have that (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's a good jacket for it um i had i had mine on and i was i was cold um and that was probably the quickest i moved across the whole of the race so i think having 
it's, I think just use your drop bag in these kind of events tactically. So look at the forecast, what's coming up. And if it looks like it's going to get really cold, then bang in like an extra layer. I love that idea of like, okay, because again, it's different to the spine. You, I could, yeah, I definitely, I've got a massive waterproof that I wouldn't want to carry. It's quite big, but I will put on if they say, you know, the forecast. I will have another waterproof in my bag as well, but not, yeah, that's a really good tip that actually have some layers. And if, because it's hard to know as well where you're going to be when yeah. you get that drop bag, which bit. And I can imagine like, yeah, the moors, they're cold. If you're covering those at night, whatever. But in April, they're still going to be really cold. You're high, you're exposed. So yeah, using the drop bag would is a, is a really good tip. What about, um, so the drop bag, it says all I need to put in it is a sleeping bag. Do you, anything else? Ro- would you put a roll mat in? Yeah, I'd, I'd have one with you. Uh, it depends on like what your plans are around sleep. So I planned not to sleep that's my loose plan to oh no what are you gonna say <laughs> <laughs> no 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 i think it's for the non traverse i think it's a really good idea because you're sleeping unless this has changed inside of it you're sleeping in tents and those tents yeah. are on like either cold or wet ground so you want to have something underneath of you if you are going to plan on sleeping in those tents it's not the same on the spine where the sleep not the sleeping bag the roll mat would have never come out in in those places where i was sleeping it would just be the bag at best, if not just like fall asleep with my head on whatever I could kind of find. So yeah, I certainly think a roll mat is useful for the non-traverse because of the tents. Um, and then other thing in there, I just had like a change of everything, um, change of all clothes, loads of food. Like I packed, I think I packed enough food to never need to be reliant on the checkpoint, especially early doors. Like I want to be as quick as possible, like through all of those. So if I didn't have to eat in them, I did end up eating, but if I didn't need to eat, I had enough food with me for the whole time. On the spine, I like really, I think it was the same for you, Eddie, if I remember rightly, like I overpacked on the food front and I was just carrying way too much weight in food on the spine because by the end of it, I just couldn't eat. Um, And I was just going then from like checkpoint to checkpoint almost and eating in the checkpoints rather than whilst I was out running. And my mouth just got like it. I just got sick of everything I was eating. So yeah, just just be mindful too about how much realistically you think you can eat whilst you are out. Whilst it might be a, the plan to eat every half an hour, every hour. In reality, that might not happen. Talking about the change of clothes, is there? This was something we mentioned a couple of weeks ago with the Dragon's Back race. Your weight for your drop bag, especially day one when everything is full up, you, the, you literally haven't got a gram to spare. Have you got a bit more luxury with the Northern Traverse as far as maybe having three changes of clothes and stuff like that? Yeah, I don't think, like, I had to weigh, re-weigh, take stuff out, re-weigh again yeah. for the Dragon's Back. I don't think I had to do that once for the Northern Traverse. Like, I was just, uh, I just put everything in, weighed it yeah. once, and I was like, if it's over, I took a few bits out. But you've got 15 kilos to to use yeah. and I think actually for a non-stop race that's fine like on the spine you've got 20 I think it was 20 kilos yeah I think it's um, 20 but the spine you do need like just because it's in the middle of winter you need a little bit more with you I think it's perfect I think 15 kilos is a really good amount multiple changes of like all of your clothes you can have like additional coats um, the coats typically don't weigh very much um, yeah. and then you've just got your food in there as well so I think it's fine I would use it up though you know if you've got 15 kilos you mentioned the weather it could literally be horrendous and it's always a minimum kit list. And we talked about this with Stuart and Mike a few, oh goodness me, a few months ago. The minimum kit list is fine, but it might not make you comfortable during the days that you're out over, especially the moors where you get quite high in the Lake District. But the moors, it's so exposed. You, 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 I can't really think of any significant cover once you get Oz Motherly, once you've climbed out of Oz Motherly. At least in the lakes, you're going up. So you're going to be, if the weather's awful, you're going up, but then you're dropping down again. And because they're yeah. all passes... It will be exposed, but the more, so that wind whips across, Gary, you know, I know it was emotional. It was emotional on just having done a recce being well fueled by a fried breakfast and knowing we were going to be in a pub in five (laughs) miles, let alone that being the end of a race. Um, Let's just, um, let's just talk a little bit about the sleep. James. So you plan not to sleep. Um, Obviously, most people will be planning a sleep and they do provide sleep station, sleep pods. Let's call them those in the, um, in the checks. What, what happened? What did, what, how did the sleep work out for you when you did the race? But this was, so the Northern Traverse for me was the first time I had done like a a long continuous stage event, Uh, not a stage, like a long continuous event. 
So I had no idea really what I was doing going into it on the sleep front. So I'd done a lot of reading about it. I'd seen what other people had done. I knew roughly I wanted to try and finish it in 48 hours. I was like, well, I, I think I can do that on no sleep. I'd had things like um, hallucinations on other runs where I'd done some of the 24-hour rounds. But this just went to like another level. I think I did about 36 hours without like sleeping. And then all of a sudden, like it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And it slowed me down to the point at which I was like, well, it just doesn't make sense for me to try carry on going at the speed I'm going. Like the sun was setting and I just laid down on a bench just before like you start going up into like the North York Moors. I can't remember like it's where you cross, you cross over the motorway and it was just a bit further on, not the motorway, the dual carriageway. Yeah. Um, and I just laid on a bench and it was only for five minutes, but it like, and I don't think I fell asleep, but I got myself into like this sort of pre-sleep state and it just did wonders. So I did that, and then I, I ran then for probably like another four or five hours over to the final checkpoint, which was Lordstones at the time. And I had about an hour, I think, on the person who was in second place. So I was like, right, I'm going to use this. I'm going to try, like, get at least 10 minutes sleep, and that'll just see me then for the remaining 40 miles. I'll get to the end. And I just I just faffed around, and I didn't manage to get to sleep again there at all. So I wasted the best part of, like, 50 minutes in that final checkpoint just faffing around. So that's certainly – I learned – from all of those checkpoints on the Northern Traverse about like what to do and not to do, like going into something like the spine, there is so much time in those checkpoints to be made or lost. So if you can streamline that process, then then go for it. But yeah, so sleep just didn't go well at all on the Northern Traverse. I didn't really get any despite trying. Yeah, but I think it did go well because you didn't need to and you managed to win. <laughs> to me, yeah, I was, but like, I was that's seeing, a dream. Some, seeing some weird, weird, weird things <laughs> when I was... Um, it was after I'd finished the moors and then you've got like a few woodland sections in that last bit. And I was just, I was all over the place. I was able to keep moving, but my head was in a, in a funny, funny little place. What time of day did you finish? 7 a.m. I think. Yeah, I was looking at the photos thinking it looks very early when you'd finished. So yeah, yeah gosh, you've only just come through the night. Yeah. Oh, your circadian rhythms are just going to be all over the place. <laughs> Finishing the race at 7 a.m., that is wild. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, wasn't wasn't the best. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about the navigation. I did the four-day recce, so I've, I've seen a lot of the course. The navigation was, I would say, like pretty straightforward, I thought. There was the odd bit, the odd turn. I think the bit, almost the most complicated bit, was um, it's a couple of bit ra- around the lead mines where you had to take... There was like one left-hand turn and one right-hand turn where there were no... They We had all the intel from Matt, the, the head of the ranger, saying yeah, they haven't got the funding to put the way markers up in certain places. So there weren't very many um, way markers there. What, what are your memories of the navigation? Any tricky bits? Yeah, I didn't. So I did the same as you. I'd wrecked. I'd wrecked that middle section, kind of like through the uh, Yorkshire Dales. So I kind of got caught out there when I wrecked it. Um, I think it was like almost like turning like quite a sharp left up yeah. through the lead mines. But I think once you've scouted that line out up that bit, I thought it was okay. And then there on out through the Yorkshire Dales, I, I think I remember that being reasonably all right. The bit where I had the most difficulty, and I don't know if this is because of sleep deprivation and or because of like the the kind of the terrain. But it was after the North York Moors going through those woods, like those wooded sections towards like the end. And I didn't like go wildly wrong, but I was almost like on the, there's a river and there's a bridge that you had to like go across. And and I just got myself on like the wrong side of those rivers. And like, it was really difficult because I was navigating off my watch as I probably most people will. You couldn't pick up like those subtle, like yeah. the subtle where the tracks are. So I, I was on the wrong side of the river. So it was just those wooded sections where you couldn't, easily see where you had to go everything else i think on the northern traverse was fairly straightforward to see where where you need to go i'll think about you when i'm in those stumbling around (laughs) 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 keep your phone on i might just be like look the way i don't know what's going on here um the other big thing i pulled from the recce james was we did the lakes the sort of uh back end we started in borrowdale and we did the we did the section all the way through to shap and boy oh boy it was much bigger then we had really bad weather which didn't help but it was a big day it was a big day out there was a lot when I looked it was like eight almost nine thousand feet of climbing and I was like 
Oh, that's spicy. <laughs> I'm quite nervous about that lake section at the f- at the front end of the race, knowing that that's not the race. That's just the warm up. How did you handle that? Did you go into it with that sort of same concern or were you like, I just... I split it up into three sections in my head, which I think like most people probably do. So, and actually I was really looking, like the lakes was the bit that I was really looking forward to because from wrecking it, I thought that's like kind of like my comfort area is like the hills and that sort of yeah. terrain. The other stuff, like the North York Moors, like I never want to go back there. Um, <laughs> but the Lake District, I'll take them all day long. So I was, I was actually really looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I know, I know scenic. exactly. I'll be the same. I'll be like, I, oh, I love this. Don't, no, don't make me get on the running <laughs> Do it bit. In reverse. <laughs> don't be on the running bit. Yeah. So I found it. I found it okay. And also, I think again, like I was just trying to like think of, I don't know, um, the kind of positives if you like as you're going through it. Like, but once you've got through the Lake District, you've done a hell of a lot of climbing. You've only really got, I think it's the nine standards after that. That's a, a big climb to do. So you've done a, a, re, a really big chunk once you've got through the Lake District. And I think it's a big thing then to have under your belt and then you go in into the night through the uh, through the Yorkshire Dales. How did you feel getting into Shap? How did the body feel? Um obviously it's the end of a big race as well did you think holy cow here i go or were you like yeah it's good done get me uh, out of here yeah because like even though it's a, the end of a race for some people like you know you're not in that race yeah um yeah. the hard bit is and it'll be i don't know how it's going to work this year given that you've got the dales traverse and the north york moors traverse for us especially towards the end of the first day in the lake district when it started getting dark you can see head torches but you don't know whether those head torches are in the race or not. Yes. yes. And we had head torches coming from behind. Uh, and I was with like a guy called uh, Rich Lazenby at this point in time. And me and Rich were having a chat. We're like, are these people in the race or not? So it made us go a lot quicker. Um, but as soon as you finish that section to Shap, that's it then. It's just you guys yeah. thereafter. Yeah. And I don't know what the timings are going to be like with regards the to... The other races start ahead. Okay. So you pro- I don't think we'll see them. Okay. I don't think we'll see the other races, but yeah, I wondered about that vibe and I wondered about people coming past you, like maybe around the horse water bit or something. You might have overtaken like a few people and then a few people are like, you know, 20 K left, I'm going to go for it. And getting caught up in that, you know, or the head, you know, it's, it's a different, but I was going to focus on me. Focus. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think once you've finished that bit, it is a big bit out of the way and you know, you've got those other two big sections left to go. So it's just, okay. I've done a third or there and thereabouts, like just keep going on. Yeah, I imagine it's a bit like getting to Middleton in the spine. Like once you get there, you're kind of like, even though you've got such a long way to go, you're in yeah. it, you're in it, shoulders deep, you know, you're just going to keep moving forward. And yeah, like yeah. what happened, you know, unless injury or pests strike you down, you're just going to keep moving forward. Um, I've seen lots of posts on the Facebook group of people asking secret spots for food or drink. Uh, I know in the spine, there's the odd bit of things that aren't talked about that people pop up with, or the odd box at a road of like, help yourself to cheddars. Amazing. Any, did you find it a problem with getting water? Um, did you stop anywhere for food? I can't remember the ins and outs, but I can't ever remember being dehydrated. No, okay. Um, I had four or 500 mil bottles. That's what I was like running with at all times, I think. And that was fine, like for the whole thing. It was just once you're going a bit steadier, like, and it's cooler, like you don't need that much. There are like, because you do go through a few like um, small villages, and I'm sure there might be like kind of a little shop in those, depending on what time you go through. The only point at which I got additional stuff was in Wreath. I think there was a coffee shop there and they were giving out free coffees to all of the runners. Um, mm. A coffee and a cake, actually, which was good. So I then got myself a coffee and then I decided to try and run with my coffee, which just <laughs> did not go well. <laughs> Wasted half of it. Um, yeah, that was, the, that was the only additional bit that I got, but I'm sure if you went looking for it, you'd find it. Because you've got R- Richmond and, like, Kirby... I, I had a look at the like yeah the distances aren't as mega as the spine you know they don't like when you leave Alston and they go so the next point of contact is 60 miles so make sure you know so the, it is a shorter distance so I think yeah if you if you go out of those uh, checkpoints well fed and watered and carrying enough you're going to be you're going to be alright I think the water sources though after after lakes I'm pretty sure apart from yeah if you go through village 
you're going to probably struggle to fill your bottles up on route. It's not like Lake District or even, say, Dragon's Back Race, where there's quite a lot of water on route. Some of the days, at least, yeah. So if anybody's thinking they might rely on a stream, I wouldn't do that, especially no, once especially, you leave the lakes anyway. Especially not yeah. around the lead mines. Don't no. drink the water <laughs> no. unless you really, you really want your race to stop. <laughs> there's nothing on the moors. I can't really think of anything on the moors I, I would be confident to drink. Yeah, no, no, no. no. But I think I think there's I do think there's enough like places to get water. Yeah, and, like you go through like as I say a few places that are small villages, towns. Like if you needed to knock on someone's door and get some water, I'm sure they'd. Uh, they'd three a.m. Yeah, yeah, three a.m. <laughs> Pick your doors wisely. Uh, you talked. To, we talked a little bit about foot, foot, shoe, and foot pain. What was your shoe of choice? uh for the northern traverse did it work would you change it this time uh i went in a pair of jackals um like last bought either jackals and they were they were really good apart from my shoelaces being too tight i didn't want something with deep lugs because like you mm -hmm. are running on paths ish um, yeah. i think you can get away with that sort of spring summer type shoe um i just don't think you need the lugs and i don't think you want like that much sort of um, abrasion underneath your feet. So I'd yeah, be going for something that you'd be happy running in on hard packed trails in. Yeah. Um, and it did, it did work really well. It was a good shoe for that. Um, and I think I, I wore the same pair all the way through to Richmond. And then I just switched at Richmond to a pair of, um, Akashas. Did you? Cause I've been thinking I've got a really comfy pair with hardly any grip though on that. I thought I might change in Richmond because do you need, you know, where where comfort overseas grip basically by the end of that sort of race isn't it it's like yeah, yeah. i'm not moving fast enough to need grip but if i my feet are comfortable and it's giving a little bit of bounce i'm more likely to run i switched quite a lot on the spine in terms of shoes whereas like some people that stayed with the same pair the whole way through i just think it depends on like how you get along with those shoes and how your feet are feeling if you want to switch it up and get into something that feels a little different then go for that if you're Sometimes jack nice. scott you can just wear the same pair the whole way through <laughs> I wouldn't Did, care about grip after wreath, to be honest. I think I'd be going for comfort after that. Yeah, that's what my thinking is too. What about waterproof socks? It's very wet at the moment. It's going to be wet. No. Nope. I wore them on the spine and it was, for me, one of the biggest mistakes I made. Like my feet, even though it was really cold on the spine, I know it was cold when you did it too. My feet just got too warm. So I ended up opting for just normal socks. Mm. And I wore normal socks on the Northern Traverse. The bit that I got wrong on the Northern Traverse was I didn't spend any time in the checkpoints trying properly trying to get them dry. Yeah, I, just letting them out. Yeah. And that trench cream that I, I think is brilliant. I went, to, I went to apply that at the beginning of the Northern Traverse. And this is because I was sleep deprived with having like a four month old at the time. I hadn't checked how much I had left. And I only had about a millimetre of the stuff left. So I put like a half application on and thereafter it was just basically run with rotten feet. Yeah, I wore waterproof socks. I wore waterproof socks for the uh, recce on the first day. But actually, because there's so much more running than the spine, yeah. um, I actually don't like running in them that much. I love hiking in them. Yeah. Um, but I was like, the downhills I found, like they don't let your foot move as well in the shoe. So I think I'm just going to do, like you said, like uh, my trusty beleaguers and then just change them at every yeah. checkpoint try. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, socks on, a bit of a lighter. And like it is going to be during the day, let's fingers crossed, it will be a little bit <laughs> warmer. I've asked you this question personally, but let's talk about poles. Did you have your poles for the whole event? Yeah, and I don't think I put them away. Um, oh, did you not? Even like on the bit, the long field sections, you kept them out? I run with my pole. Like once my poles are out, like that's it. Like I find them so helpful on the flat just in terms of taking a little bit of weight off my knees. I neglected the gym uh, for the Northern Traverse, but for the spine, I not the spine, well, the spine, I did a bit of gym work there. Dragon's Back, I did plenty of gym work. And I worked on upper body strength too, yeah. both of those just to make sure I was pretty good and efficient with the poles. Um, yeah, once they were once they were out, that was it. I used them all the time. I wasn't going to use them, and then you convinced me. And then when I when I did the recce, I was like, "There's no way I'm not going up these with that." <laughs> you weren't going to use them at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was like, thinking, 
wrecking. And then, well, I was the only one when we did the recce and I got them out up the car. I climb so much better with poles because I use them all the time here and I might as well use my big muscles. Um, been working on this, my hench upper body look, so I might as well use it. But I was thinking, you know, maybe, but I also know how much when I've done these longer races, how much you use them as well for stability and leaning yeah. on, like even just like a moment of like you're standing, just take the weight off your legs or anything. So yeah, I'm pretty sure once mine, though I don't use them for descending, you're probably... What was, uh, there was some equation James used when he came on the podcast before. It was like tons of weight it takes out of your body over these massive long races using the poles. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's still a lot of people who are unsure as to whether or not like the benefit that they bring about, but... I think on the, especially on the shorter distance stuff, but on the longer distance stuff, I'm, for me, like anecdotally, there is a, a lot of benefit in, in using them. You've done the race, James. You've won the race. Uh, any top tips you'd give to me, <laughs> listeners? <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> Don't bring new gear into the equation. And I know this is like a, like as, um, as old as the age of time type thing, but uh, don't bring any new gear into the equation. Like, in the week or days before the event if you haven't tested it and tested it properly then i'd really like it's a big old risk if you're bringing it in when you're doing the actual event like i did that with my shoes they were only two weeks old those shoes i'd done maybe i don't know up to 10 miles in them so i'd never really like felt the tension in those laces and it was only when i got onto the course and i was like sort of 40 50 miles in and i started feeling like these pain points on my feet and didn't figure it out that was just because i'd got a new bit of kit new pair of trainers and i hadn't properly like run them in and test them out um and i also did the same too with a bum bag i bought a bum bag like in the week before thinking it would be really good and it was okay but once i <laughs> filled that bum bag up it, i couldn't then access it like i just couldn't get my hands in to get the stuff out so it was just again again it's just the practicing with the stuff that you you plan yeah. to run and race in and if you haven't got the time to practice and properly prepare then uh, i wouldn't be taking it with me on the event so i i learned from that and in the spine i was really like testing everything out before uh deciding whether or not i was going to use it but that i think is my only that's my only main sort of learning i think it's just a case of just with the Northern Traverse, getting it done. <laughs> it's so much management, these massive races, aren't they? They're, they're like, and on almost you have to learn on the job. You have to learn, you have to make your mistakes and you can, you know, we can listen to your wise words, but until you're there and you're in your checkpoint and your stuff's everywhere and you're like, I didn't need that, I didn't need that, or I did need that, or I should have checked my trench cream. Should it, you know, it's like, don't, if you do make the big mistakes, it doesn't matter. It's all, these are yeah. adventures. These are yeah. adventures. And yeah. just make sure if you've got enough calories and you're warm enough, you can keep moving forward. I had some short ones and I thought they were going to be ace for a race, but as soon as I started running, they shuffled their way down my thighs. <laughs> that was basically, <laughs> and it was horrendous. I thought they were awesome, but once they were full of gels and everything and all the weight, it was like, you no, know, terrible, terrible idea. Okay, before we go to the quick five questions, James, what's next for 2024? I have got my name unofficially but it's officially in the spine challenger north this summer i'm pretty sure like that is on the cards but i've definitely got a place at the ultra trail mont rosa in september <gasps> oh um, so that's the that's the I'm, the reason i'm doing the spine is in preparation for the spine in winter but uh, the utmr is uh is a real big one that i'm looking forward to and uh, and getting some proper elevation done again um, yeah, what are the so dates on that? That's massive, isn't it? My goodness me, what we're looking at for that race? I think it's 11,000 metres um, <laughs> for the set and 100, 100 miles. But oh like, it's been a nice part of the world, so just that'll yeah. take your mind off those those hills, I think. Oh, it'd be great as well because yeah. it's it looks sensational, but you haven't got all the kind of circus of the UTMB too. I've got to ask it because it's very topical. Have you got an eye on the... You'll know people who know how to get into this race. Have you got an eye on the Barclay Marathons? Can't use a compass. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. Not at the moment. It's not, it just doesn't appeal to me. It's not my kind of race, I don't think. Oh, see, I like that because sometimes we see these races and I'm the same with the spine race. It looks awesome. I love all the photographs, but when I step back and reflect, it's like, no, that's not, that's not for Gary. That's not for Gary. Quick five. Okay. This could be quite triggering for some people. Do you allow ketchup? On your roast dinner, James? No. 
<laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely you not. wait till you wait till your little girl goes. Ketchup. Ketchup. No, she she will not even know know what it is. Cheese sauce, on the other hand, I think is a great addition to any roast dinner. I love ketchup and I would put it on, but I just what? would be too scared of the reaction. So I don't, I don't. <laughs> you said it now. <laughs> oh, I love ketchup. I drench it. I do <laughs> love ketchup. I love ketchup on a chip. Ketchup on a chip or uh, actually just ke- only chips ketchup. Yeah. Maybe a burger. <laughs> what about, are you, uh, okay. No. Well, if you put it on a roast dinner, you're ruining that roast dinner. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe this is going to trigger you too. Sorry. Uh, what about a, a Yorkshire pudding on a Christmas dinner? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, well. he said cheese sauce. He's up for anything. He's up for all the condiments. <laughs> I think the, the Yorkshire pudding adds a lot, in, in my mm. mind, to a, a roast dinner. So, yeah. But that's not um, that's not held by the family, that that one. So we sometimes have a bit of a scuffle <laughs> as to whether or not they're going on. <laughs> well, this will uh, actually give some real insight into the type of man you are, James. Have you ever cheated when playing a board game with your friends and family? I can't remember the last time we played played a board game. So uh, <laughs> my my wife is notorious at trying to uh, make things go in her favour when playing these kind of things. So I know how annoyed I get at her when she's doing that. So my she's got a hand in the off. bank, hasn't she? My goodness, mate, yeah, yeah, five hundred. She's, she's loading the bank. <laughs> what about you, Eddie? You, you uh, slip a little. Uh... Oh, yeah. All day, every day. <laughs> Mainly to make it finish earlier because it's normally because it's, I'm like, oh my God, how long is this going on? I either bankrupt myself and I'm like, oh, I'm out. Oh, mummy's out. She better go and make some tea. Or. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are you currently watching on? Oh, doesn't have to be Netflix. It could be Amazon, Disney, or even just regular TV. Anything you're binge watching at the moment? Oh, The Gentleman on Netflix has <sighs> been like getting into that. Yeah. And then- Yes, I, I like listened it. to a podcast of yours not too long since, and I have also binge watched Love Is Blind, all of the seasons of that. So, yeah, I, knew, <laughs> I was I like, knew. I've got to get it in because it's good. It's good. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? What? Very it's good. it's too good because it's just so awful. No, you're yeah. just like, oh, and you feel for these people. They're so desperate. What channel is this on? I need to watch this. That's two people. Netflix. Netflix, Netflix. Okay. Gary. Wait right. till the live reunions as well. They they all. Oh. I yeah, even watched the live reunion because I was like, I need to find out what happened. And then it all comes it. out. There's, there's a few. It's definitely worth watching for the last season. Love is blind. I, that's, I didn't think that was going to be my takeaway from this chat. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this is going to go after Easter. So kind of reflect back. But yeah, what Easter egg do you hope you've scoffed on Easter? What's your favourite type of Easter egg? I mean, we've had a, we've had an absolute treasure trove of them already. Really like the kind of the galaxy ones. Yeah, that's like that, that chocolate and an Easter egg, I think, is is a winning combination. So uh, if I have one of those, that'd be good. Going to go back to your teenage years, James. What posters would we see on your bedroom wall? I, mean, I definitely had one of Megan Fox back in the day. Going to say this uh, is a PG show, James. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> One of that. That's the only one I can remember, actually. Um, oh. It was it was a good poster. <laughs> no, too much. <laughs> okay, and you can't actually Inst- Instagram story music. And last time, if memory's right, it was "Can't Stop" by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. You can't pick that song this time, James. But yeah, apart from that song, what is your Instagram story music going to be? You might have to leave that all with me. I haven't haven't thought about that in preparation for today. I don't know. Leave it. Leave it with me. Okay. okay, it'll be a surprise. Terrible answer. It'll You've be got surprise. two weeks. The clock's ticking now. <laughs> the clock is ticking. One last question for me. We've got you here. People are two days into the Northern Traverse, Dragons Back. Any of these big races, everything's hurting. Everything's chaffing. Still got a little way to go. What do you think about when the chips are down and you just got to focus the mind? Where does your mind go or does it not go anywhere? I try and shut my brain off as much as I can in these sorts of things. I just find anything to distract it from the feelings in your legs and your body. So it's putting a song on, singing along to a song, thinking if I need to about some of the reasons why I might be doing this and like the sacrifices you've made but they don't last forever so it's just a case of just grudge through it and uh, and wait until you pop out the other side do you listen to music podcasts or anything in a race no like usually when did i 
I didn't listen to any music, I don't think, in either, but I will just find the song in my head and I'll just sing it. I will recycle the same line about a hundred <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. times because um, I can't remember more than one line at a time. <laughs> <laughs> that's your tactic to uh, finish that's... off the opposition. I um, I was interested. <laughs> David Bourne, he he wanted to lean on a, f- a friend when he he found a trail buddy when he was feeling down. Last week's guest, but if you're at the pointy end, James, there's not many people around. What do you? <laughs> I don't know what you do then. There, there are usually people around, like, and it's but then it gets to the crunch point of like when when do do you either want those people not to be around or whether when do they leave you? Um, yeah, you don't. You just don't have that choice. You've just got to just got to keep going. It is nice to run with other people for a bit of time, but I think my learning for the spine next year is I got a bit too comfortable running with people, um, and I have to. I think probably spend a bit more time on my own in the next spine in order to give myself a good shot. At it. I'll go back to your injury with the spine. Did you have any warning signs earlier on that you think maybe if I manage this slightly different could have could have finished it? No, it was like it so. It was. It felt fine until I got up onto um, oh, what's the the big hills called um, where Greg's hut is. What's that? Okay. What's that? That yeah, what, that, cross that fell. over over cross, cross fell. Yes, over cross fell, and it was frozen like absolutely solid on top of there. And I had to put my uh, like kind of crampons, micro spike things on. Oh, and then yeah. I ran down. There was like a six mile descent then, yeah. and I ran down the majority of that with with them on. on. And I like that's the bit I think like would have just made my foot land differently. Um, and I think it was probably that. But I had no pain going down that hill. It was only when I got onto the road and then all of a sudden it was just like stabbing and it's pretty excruciating. If I did the spine again, I would... James had these amazing... Uh, I think the Cyclone La Sportiva with the tiny little micro spikes within the trainer. And yeah. I remember watching him put it at them on to go across the Cheviots thinking... Can I take them off him? Because I really want those and I think I need them more than him. But that would would be something I would probably fit in my drop bag rather than running in those terrible spikes because they just ruin the bottom of your feet. as well. Yeah, Yeah, and they just break. Mine just broke. I remember the um, mountain rescue like saying, you need to put your spikes on for this bit and me thinking... They're in a hedge. They're broken. I've got them in my bag, but I are they? Bro- if they see, I was like, if they see they're broken, they might not let me go. So I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put them on just up here, yeah. thinking. So yeah, <laughs> we've all been there. We've all been there. Yeah, this is going to be too not enough notice of people doing the Northern Traverse, but we do have quite a few listeners who are taking part in the 2024 Dragons Back race. You obviously had a really successful race. Is there anything that you think you did differently to? Other runners that maybe didn't have such a successful day. Like this might sound daft. I like for the first five days, like I I ran well within myself, and I was very very conscious the whole time. Like if I go hard in certain sections, it, it's going to come back and bite me at some point. So I tried to just run at I don't know 80, 85 percent and avoid that red zone as much as I could. Yeah, and everyone's red zone is going to be different. I think just be very mindful that this is a long game. Like it's a day by day. You have got time each evening to rest. And I also went hard on the recovery each evening too. And I think if you've got the time, even a little bit of time, just to really focus on recovering, sorting your feet out, getting your legs maybe in a pair of compression shorts, rolling your legs if you can, going to the river. It might not feel nice. Just do that because it will. It will pay dividends like the next day. Oh, yeah. That would be, I think that's, that's a, a, yeah, big thing for the dragons back. James, we know you've got a dash. We love you. Thank you for once again coming on the podcast. We cannot wait until we your first interview post Spine Win 2025. We will make sure that Gary's got a microphone at Kurt Yetum uh, to record <laughs> your finish. Good luck with the preparation for that. Good luck at um, UTMR, I think they call it, don't they? Um, and so nice to catch up with you again. And I will think of you a lot in Northern Traverse. What would James do? He would sing the same song again and again. <laughs> do that. Thank you so much, James. See you guys. Thank Thanks, you. James. Take okay. care. Thanks so much, James, for coming on the podcast. Uh, best of luck with UTMR. That is one on our bucket list, isn't it? Bad time of year for oh, us. Big time. Complaining parents because it's on always on when they go back to school. But as Gary said to me, you could have just WhatsApp James all those questions, but I wanted to share the love. <laughs> I wanted to share the love with everybody. An abuse, <laughs> abuse of power. 
um, might be useful. You might be listening to it while you're doing the Northern Traverse, or you might be on the way to the Northern Traverse, or you might be thinking about one of the Northern Traverse or Dragon's Back or Spine. All good stuff. All good stuff. Thank you so much, James, and look forward to catching up with you again later in the year. Strava, another busy week over on Strava. Moza Hill, hashtag GB Ultra Ambassador. Everyone's a request to follow, actually, so I don't know really know oh. what they've been up to. But 111 miles for Moza. Four runs, 50 miles was the longest run. So, yeah, that's super interesting what that was. Average pace of 12 minutes and 41 seconds and a total elevation for the week of 855 feet. Rob Brown, 54.6 miles for the week, 10 runs, longest run of just under nine miles, 11 Point three six minute the mile in, and with an elevation of 12,904 feet. It's really interesting to look at everybody's week and, you know, mm-hmm. super big miles of Moser. How has he managed to do 800 feet in a week? He must be on That's, a treadmill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Michelle Young, request to follow too. 88.9 miles, 10 runs, 24.6. That's a big, long run for the, her longest run. With an average pace of 10 minutes and 50 seconds and just over 7,000 feet there. 7,310 feet of elevation. Awesome, awesome. And another bumper week of merch on the trails. I love it. Multiple family members too, rocking the tea and trail snood. You're yeah, rocking keep it coming. the hoodie. You're rocking the hoodie today. <gasps> oh, breasts are up. <laughs> Mine are far too low to do that. Hurt. <laughs> I have to lift them. <laughs> <laughs> right, talking of tits, let's go tales from the trails. I actually have personal knowledge of this next Tales from the Trails because I also have spent some happy hours in these toilets. So I think I should read this, Gary. Horton in Riversdale. Public toilets are a triumph that provide a warm Yorkshire welcome. Review of Penny Ghent. Bear with us, everybody. This will make sense as we go along. Penny Ghent was a triumph. 90 miles into the Spine Challenger South race at 2am on a Sunday night. The blistering wind felt bone-chillingly cold. I think I saw a shooting star as I scrambled to the top in what was a breathtaking celestial display on a crisp and clear pitch black sky, but it might have been a sleep-deprived hallucination. Oh, the track into Horton and Ribblesdale along the Pennine Way was icy and stony. My poor feet. Maybe an escalator on the next refurb? But the true triumph of the adventure were the public toilets in Horton and Ribblesdale. It was 4am. I was exhausted, cold and hungry. The toilets provided an ideal five-star sleeping opportunity. It was out with a sleeping mat, sleeping bag and a bivvy. A tin of rice pudding provided quad on blue sustenance. The water tap, an endless supply of refreshment that Greek gods would die for. I had two blissful hours of sleep that left me feeling refreshed and raring to go along the delightful cam road into Hawes. What made the experience even more exciting was the celebrity spotting in the public toilets. One of the spine leaders, who shall remain nameless, overtook me, a humble spine challenger, as I lay slumbered. He joyfully skipped over my sleeping bag bound morass into the cubicle. (laughs) Suffice to say he had musical ablutions. His extra skip as he bounded over me and onwards was an indicator of the blistering place ahead. Head. The public toilets at Horton and Ribblesdale are the jewel in the crown of any trip along the Pennine Way or in a centre of Penny Ghent. I say make them a UNESCO site of historical importance. If Shakespeare was alive today, I suspect Hamlet would be regarded as a secondary work after he penned a history play dedicated to these fine public toilets. Richard Bulmer. You've done the spine or any of the spine throw off races. You'll know this toilets. And it's a long way since you've last come from anywhere where you get into these, this little, you've come off Penny Ghent and there's a long descent, which is, is really rocky and icy and long and goes on for ages that those toilets. I remember James and I sharing a Biscoff biscuit because it's all we have left <laughs> before the Camai road. Oh, the stuff of dreams. <laughs> stuff of dreams. Gary, I've got some sad news. It's really sad. Is this for the podcast sad or? This is for the podcast sad. Oh my God. (laughs) But you were being serious. I know. You went, oh God, what's happening now? I do. Drama. Drama. Got no reviews. Not (gasps) reviews. Let's not lie. Let's not make them up. Gareth. Cupid is bare. The cupid is empty. Gareth from Wingate, from Durham. Edith. Rex. (laughs) 
<laughs> we understand. You probably all left them. There's thousands. There are. It's busy. Thousands. It's Easter. Lots going it's busy, on. It's easy. Let's let it go this week. But I tell you what, next week, if those cupboards are bad, you know what you're going to get, guys? Be hell on. I'm going to send Gary around your houses with a notebook and a pen. And I'm going to make you dictate a review to him. <laughs> and I'm not sure his writing and spelling are up. I'm going to force my deeds on time. you. <laughs> I'm going to add you to a WhatsApp group. <laughs> which I'm going to start sending messages at about 4 a.m. Ding, ding, Ooh. ding, 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 ding. So when you wake up, you've got 84 messages. And they're all <laughs> going to be in Japanese. So it's going to be hard to understand. So if you don't want that happening to you, pop over to where you get podcasts and leave us a review and we will find it. Oh, yes, we will. Oh, yes. You there are walk. some lovely comments comments over on Spotify, though. Apologies if we don't read out the Spotify ones because they're Why not like a review. Why don't we read the Spotify ones? Well, they are just kind of like, uh, oh, great podcast. They're not. But then people think that they're leaving us a review. This is tricky. Why? Where do they have to? I'm confused. Yeah, I, I have seen them, but they're not like a formal review. It's like a comment. It's a bit different how they do that. But yeah, we do see them. Well, I see them. And I appreciate <laughs> them. <laughs> How do you find the reviews? I want to read them now. Can I rate the show? What would you rate the Tea and Trails show? I've got the option this of five This one in stars. particular? <laughs> yeah, it's I'm only going to be five stars. Two. Oh, Eddie, no, do not. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to write a review. How do I write a review? I don't know. I don't use well, if we don't know how to do it, how can we ask people to do it? Share, they, report. They comment on, in, on an individual episode. Oh, it's okay. Not let's like go on to yeah. let's go on to Emily's episode. See let's more. Try harder. Question answer. What did you think about the pod? This episode. Ah, I'm that's where say, the, that's how they come in. Okay, yeah, it was incredible. Gary was Gary sensational. Is electric. <laughs> Eddie needs to do better. <laughs> 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 okay, I've posted that. Now, where do we see it? Can I do this to, like just generally to you? Just send yeah. you messages. <laughs> uh, right, guys. If you find out, we you know leave us a review. Don't leave us a review. We're only joking. We're only really, joking. Only joking. Not really. We've got a competition. <gasps> Have we? <gasps> yes. Well, Patreon Hellfire Events. They are supplying the prizes for this week's competition too. Two free entries for one of their backyard ultra events, and I'll. Their events take place in May, June, August, and October. So lots to choose from. It looks awesome too. Yeah, if you want to run around a prison, then you are in luck. The world's <laughs> first and only backyard ultra inside oh, a prison. No, no. this uh, what Actually, Sounds inside. Wild. Yeah, I don't are know. Are there the still days. people in the prison? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I honestly, I what, honestly don't. Are we know. talking like high security prison? Because I'm, I'm all right for going to like one if you've like paid Strange your taxes a bit late or something, or you've diddled, um, maybe not diddling, but uh, I don't want to go in a one where there's really scary people. Some nasty people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. <laughs> I don't Can you find that you. out for me before I enter, please? Bit of dates, we got some more dates. But yeah, if you're a legend patron or above, then you don't need to do any anything because you guys are awesome everybody else will need to <laughs> like the competition post and share the competition post and make sure you check your privacy settings because we can't always see who has shared the post winners picked at random 15th of april that sounds about enough time Ooh, a that's weeks. a couple of weeks yeah a couple of weeks nice and good luck and thanks to hellfire events for supporting this week's competition What? you got your head in your hands. <laughs> oh, three right. days to sort Let's my relax. life out. relax. We've got three days. <laughs> We've got three days to, to, to sort everything out. Let's not worry about work, life, everything else. Okay. I've done as far this morning. Got all this kid all sorted. He's going. He's going away for three days. That's almost lovely. I'm sad I'm not going to see his ski racing, but is. Two kids are easy. They say, like, don't they? Like, two kids is fine. When you add the third one, that's when it goes. It's when you have more kids than hands. That's when you can't <laughs> do anything. Much. Anyway, so I've only got two kids, so that's actually almost a little bit easier. I've done as far this morning with my personal race admin to sort my five big plastic bag things that I use to that are going in my drop bag for each drop bag point. 
to refill with sandwiches and stuff. That's all I've done. I haven't packed. Everything's ready. Like it's all out in the back room on the treadmill because I've been on the treadmill for about 10 days. I just need to sort it out. But I, I like to have time. I don't like to do it bits. So I'll do it tomorrow or the next day, the day before. Nothing like doing it the day before. But that is just the way that it's going to go. Suck it up. I'm going to go to CAFO tomorrow, stock up. Because I'm flying so late due to the fact that this hasn't worked out very well, the, the timing of this race. So I'm only flying the day before, which I hate doing, but never mind. But it does mean that I can go to CAFO and get all my food and just I'll sort that all out. I'm even going to make my sandwiches before I go. So if they lose them, my bag on the fly, I'm not doing the race. Please lose my bag. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought that before. <laughs> just a light break of my leg. That's all I need. Or oh, I just need to have a week in hospital and then four weeks on the sofa watching Netflix. Anyway, um, so I'm going to sort all my, get get all my food tomorrow. Baby Bells, Fisherman Friends, all the quality stuff I'm going to put. Yeah, and then I'll just raid the kids' Easter eggs, supplies, whatever they've got left. Not sure I'm going to do it. I'm not sure I can fit in any running, but I do walk the dogs. I walk my dogs, Gary, four or five miles a day, which is nice. That's what I like. Put on a podcast. Today, it was in sleet. Oh, so cold. <laughs> it was miserable. Um, and I'll try, I'm going to try and have a, a couple of naps to catch up, catch up a bit on that sleep. I haven't got any more really early, apart from the flight, but... Be what it'll be. Treat yourself, Eddie. Have a nap. Be lovely. I'm going to have a nap. If you, if you stop talking, I could have a nap okay. now. All right, come on. Just just do it in a quick <laughs> nutshell. What are you doing? Wrap I'm it up. 80, 80 miles <laughs> oh. and then say I'm tapering. Oh, wrap it up. Well, yeah, too many miles last week. So 100% pay it more attention. I think it says about 50 miles for the week. So I don't want to be too far north of that. Lots of mobility, you know, lightweights. I'm not even too sure if I'll go to the gym, actually. I might just do it all at home. Because being a one car family, going to the gym, that's like a four or five mile round trip on foot. So don't want to do that. But yeah, mobility form roll. And I'm really feeling it's uh, it's improving things because my, I got achy back, bit of bum ache too, and my hammies. And that's obviously putting pressure on my knee. So that, yeah, I think it could be a bit of sciatica. So yeah, lots of foam rolling. I don't want to sound like I'm sandbagging, but... Reducing the miles and lots of mobility. Like every day, I'll probably spend about 30 minutes doing bits and bobs on that. Jeez, and yeah. I spend like two minutes on my foam roller and that is enough relationship with that oh, thing for me. I love it. I really feel it on my left-hand side and my lower back. I just feel that ache. I see my quads um, spasming quite a lot. They like uh, twitching the muscles, but my right-hand side, everything is hunky dory so yeah get on top of that but i've got a race there is a <laughs> of course you have of course you have well the, i've got this really a... bad sciatics already and i've got and i've got i'm really tired i'm going to do less runs then i'm going to do a, a race, race. <laughs> well there is a workout on the week and i think it's like 20 minutes another threshold run about 20 minutes so there's a local race near me muddy roads they put on lots of trail races from north yorkshire to the northeast and it's basically called the pine peas which is in trimden which i can say trimden probably two villages away from myself it's 5k on the trails with a pie at pine peas at the finish and yeah if you're vegetarian you catered for two i've done it before we need to find a pie sponsor for this um podcast because yeah i don't want gins mind you i'm not going to be fussy if gins just rock up i'm going to turn them away but I have nice. a pucker pie that I get occasionally. They do a lovely veggie one of yeah. those. And it's Linda, almost Linda like, McCartney, she does a nice pie. Let's scout around and see. <laughs> it's got to be a well, moist yeah. pie as well. I don't want to dry. I think Ginster is a bit dry. Too much pastry. Can you have too much pastry? I, I made an apple crumble for Easter, our Easter roast that was on Tuesday night. <laughs> By the time we finish it. And the, I said to the guys, oh, kids, I'm really sorry. I made this so quickly. There's so much topping compared to apple. And they were like, no, we don't eat this with the apple. That's what he said. <laughs> Whoever, oh, I'm putting this out there. Whoever supplies the produce for the Reggae service station just outside of Penrith, I will bite their hand off for a, <laughs> for, 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 I'll do anything for, for a sponsor from those guys. But yeah, I've cater for vegetarians too. And I've done it before when it was in Norton, but it's moved to Trimden. So yeah, muddy roads. Really looking forward to that 5k on the trails. I'll just treat it like a threshold run, catch up with mm. some mates, trying because I've, popped the lid but i'm trying to stay off the sugary treats it's super tough it's not just don't eat them you know people don't actually have food that's super tough you not putting oh, your hand Eddie, in the cookie that's like really, that's a terrible <laughs> you're not putting your hand in the cookie jar just don't do it well this is this is exactly what i need to do if i don't do it i find it quite easy i found lent quite easy 
As that's soon what Jesus as I have... said. That's what Jesus said. <laughs> Smashed it. <laughs> Smashed it. But as soon as I have one chunk, it just turns it. So yesterday, one chunk turned into about four chunks. Then I hit the Tony's. We had some Tony's chocolate, a uh, tribute to David Bourne. And then Ray gave me a little bag of mini eggs, smashed those as well. So I had a lot. A lot. And Prosecco. You are like, a, a, you are like an eight-year-old girl. <laughs> like your inability to like, when you go, no, no, no more. How many have you had? And they're like, oh, no. Oh, no. Just going to keep eating it. Well, it's like what Bryn said. It doesn't satisfy you, so you just keep. keep well, going, now you know the deets. On. I'm going to get him to send you the actual study. But I as he it, said, I either see the whole bag, then then I'll feel full. <laughs> so maybe don't follow his wisdom. <laughs> what I'm going to do over on YouTube, though, fingers crossed, my Polar Race review will finally be out. Oh goodness me, these take me so long. I enjoy. I've it, been but... waiting every morning. Fresh Everybody's fresh. been. <laughs> but I'm also working on a new band's. Piero version 8 review. I really like it. It's really enjoyable. I really like those shoes. I've worn those shoes for when I've had a bit more road options. Yeah, really like got a little yeah. bit more grip. Nice. Uh, the fresh form, new balance, new balance too. But without that super shoe carbon plate, yeah, I get a lot of people. Quite a few reviews I've done lately have been super shoes. And yeah, they're like all oh, £200 North shoes. I appreciate it. Oh, for most people, at least £200 is a lot of money. So it's nice to have a shoe review with a more affordable price tag. Also, you don't want to be wearing a super shoe if you're trail most trail races. You're not going to get your bang for your buck if you're running yeah. a long ultra out of a carbon shoe. I think personally. I'll tell you, little hundred. Well, I super saw you, you nimble on your feet when we did the recce in those carbon shoes. <laughs> 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 yeah, not a good advert. <laughs> That's it, everybody. I'm gonna I've got 30 minutes until my next I can do it. I'm incredible at power nap. I'm gonna go straight. How long up. will it take you? Literally, you have lulled me into a semi. <laughs> You've been dribbling out of your cheeks. <gasps> Isn't that the best? <laughs> so snap, slight <laughs> dribble down my chin. Anyway, you all rock. Love you all. Pray for me at, uh, I was going to say National Traverse. Pray for me at the National <laughs> Traverse. Might not be my finest performance, guys, but hopefully, as I thought about this morning, it's going to be a building block to other adventures. We're going to live and learn. Whatever happens, I'm going to provide you with the best content the week after. <laughs> Thank you to Precision Fuel Hydration for sponsoring this week's show. Don't forget to use code CAPSOCKT24 for 15% off. Thank you to our partners and patrons too. We couldn't do without this. We couldn't do this without you and your ongoing support. I'll try and do you all proud out there this weekend. I'm going to step up for that penalty again and again and again. I think you're going to be awesome, Eddie. You're going to pull up you're your... You're lovely. You're so... <laughs> you're going to pull up your big girl pants and uh, get your head in the game. It's going to be... I do. I do wear my big girl pants on these long races. You want it safely tucked in, warm and no exposure. And good luck. Wow, we've got quite a few listeners doing... There's the Northern Best Traverse, there's the not. Lakes Traverse, there's the oh. Dales Traverse and there's the Moors Traverse. Whatever. Can't wait. I want to snog traverse. off everybody all the way. So full embrace, please. She on goes the in trail. hard, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, be kind to future self. Breathe and believe. Progress, not perfection. Keep your shield high. Be arsed and run to the barrier. Don't stop till you reach that barrier. I, I like the sentiment, Eddie. But on it's not in there I forever. Oh. Well, the barrier, no, it's, I, I like it, but the barrier seems negative to me. You need to, mm. the sentiment's correct, but re -phrase. Run to the gate. Do you want a gate? Do you want it's gate? It's like past, do you want to smash past it, you know, don't. Do you? Because I don't think Jasmine yeah. wanted to smash past that. I think she wanted to lie across it. Like oh, the 100 meter sprinters, asking, they don't, they don't run to the line. Jasmine is coming on the podcast, but it will be, it will be a month or so's times, Ladies. but it will be worth the wait. It will be yes. worth the wait, but she has said yes. And so we're delighted. Can't wait for my Bessie Frezzy and me to get together again on Zoom. That's what she says. You're a best friend. I know. She's so happy. <laughs> my name is Carrie. <laughs> and I'm Eddie Sutton. And that was episode 65 of the Tea and Trails podcast. <laughs>